What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. So getting into the Sinestro Core War aftermath, this is really kind of like an epilogue slash prologue or prelude. And the reason why is because where most writers, and, and for those of you guys who are new to comics, most writers will usually write like a crossover event or some huge story arc, and then they'll stop. And they'll just do like some small time story or something like that. Just something that doesn't really tie into anything and is just kind of there. Uh, what Jeff Johns did for the whole entirety of Green Lantern is one story arc, the conclusion of a story arc, would lead into the beginning of another story arc. And so this basically goes into Blackest Night because remember, Blackest Night is a whole idea of like these emerging lantern cores and so on and this great big huge war and, and you know all those different things. And so it was cool for what it was, but it was basically this great big huge conflict. And so a lot of the different, a lot of the things that we're going to see between now and the time we start blackest night here in the next i don't know maybe month or so a uh, couple months these things will all basically go into the event of the blackest night story itself so what this does is this picks up again with the aftermath of sinestro core war and in the last video when we had done that sinestro core war we had talked about how it was really the first major emergence of the yellow lanterns the first major emergence of sinestro forming his own lantern core now remember where the green lanterns basically derive their power from the will aspect of the emotional spectrum which is to say the ability to overcome fear, the Sinestro Core derives their power from fear. And so long as there's fear in the universe, so long as there's a singular being that experiences fear or is afraid of something, then the Sinestro Core will always have power because again, they derive their power from the emotional spectrum, just this infinite source of emotion. As long as there is a being alive in the universe, there will be different forms of emotions. And so again, with this whole idea, what we know is that the Sinestro Core rings are still going out and seeking hosts. They're still trying to find people who could be viable candidates to become members of the Sinestro Corps. And that's really one of the basis or one of the biggest ideas of this is that Sinestro set it up so that should he be defeated, the core will continue to grow. And so the idea is that while all this is happening, we actually pick up with Kyle Rayner and Guy Gardner. Now remember, Kyle Rayner and Guy Gardner is part of the Green Lantern Corps do their own thing for the most part, but the Green Lantern Corps line of stories ran side by side with the main Green Lantern stories in the sense that the Green Lantern Corps just focused on the other core members, what the other members outside of Hal Jordan were basically doing. And the funny thing about this is this basically Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner taking off and intending to live on Oa and then Guy Gardner wanting to open a bar. <laughs> and it's kind of a funny scenario because remember, uh, these characters come from their own backgrounds. They come from their own heritages, their own stories. And for the most part, they've all lost a lot of different things. Kyle Rayner more so than most. Kyle Rayner's girlfriends have all been killed. Uh, you know, he lost his mother to a parasite that was basically a member of the Sinestro Corps. You know, they've all lost different things. And so leaving planet Earth and taking up residence on Oa serves two purposes. Purposes. The first is that within the confines of the Green Lantern mythos, it gives Kyle Rayner and Guy Gardner their own stories, their own adventures they can go out on and do their own thing. But the other half of this is that it actually sets the stage for future events later on with regards to why it is that they're in space, as opposed to Hal Jordan who's spending some of his time on Earth. So again, it's really setting the stage for a lot of the things that we will see later on down the line when it comes to the Green Lantern mythos. Now at this point, we pick up with Mongol, who is the son of Mongol, <laughs> which is kind of Weird. The first Mongol, or as is usually referred to, Mongol One, is basically like this pre-Crisis on Infinite Earths character that served the purpose of just being a major foe of Superman. The idea, though, was that with this version of Mongol, basically Mongol Two, as a lot of people call him, uh, he made his emergence in 1995 with the Showcase line of stories, I think it was. And I want to say the Showcase stories in the mid-90s were basically stories that were designed to literally showcase different villains and heroes and so on and so forth. But the idea is that the original Mongol had helped to destroy Coast City, which set in motion, the idea of Hal Jordan, be, you know, being possessed by Parallax and then becoming a villain and so on and so forth. Uh, what Mongol 2 did is he basically followed up with his father's grand schemes of trying to either defeat the Justice League or defeat Superman or something along those lines, but he basically became a villain. Now, his big claim to fame was having a helping hand in Superman, you know, basically being prepared for the invasion of Imperiax. And Imperiax is, of course, basically DC's version of Galactus. I mean, I, there's really no way to say it. I mean, that's pretty much what he was. But the idea is that despite a few instances here and there, when Mongol has helped out Superman, they've basically become unwilling allies due to a common enemy that was stronger than both of them individually. For the most part, Mongol has just always been a bad guy. And so what ended up happening here, or at least what ends up taking place here, is that Mongol is bestowed with the Yellow Lantern Ring. Now remember, this makes sense, because when it comes to the Yellow Lantern Rings, they're designed to instill fear. And we saw during the Sinestro Core War that like Anti-Monitor and Hank Henshaw, Cyborg Superman, that Superboy Prime, these various individuals had basically been imbued with a Yellow Lantern 
Elden Ring because of the fact that they were able to, you know, instill so much fear in individual people. Mongol is much the same way. The difference here is that he actually has kind of an ace up his sleeve, a really cool, a really cool hat trick that actually works really well for the purpose that he serves. Now, again, jumping back to Kyle Rayner and, uh, and Guy Gardner, with the whole idea of the story, humor is kind of an, imp an important aspect of the Green Lantern mythos, especially with what's coming later on down the line, because things are going to get really, really dark. <laughs> no pun intended. When Blackest Night rolls around, things will get really dark. Like, it'll be, it'll be really kind of crazy. But again, for these guys, it's a matter of just kind of trying to make a way for themselves, you know, trying to make their own little home, you know, home away from home and taking up residence on Oa. Now, remember, this is not unprecedented. There are people who simply just reside on Oa. Kilowog, for example, resides on Oa. Salak resides on Oa. These different members of the, the Green Lantern mythos, of course, Kilowog basically being the drill sergeant for the Green Lantern Corps and Salak being the voice of the Guardians of the Universe, it makes sense that they would reside on Oa. But for Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner, they can really serve or really have the best use when they're on Oa. And the reason for this is because of the fact that, remember, with regards to the Green Lanterns, for the most part, Earth is the only planet that really has like four different Green Lanterns. You've got Kyle Rayner, you've got Jon Stewart, you've got Guy Gardner, and you've got Hal Jordan. You don't need four. <laughs> you really only need two. And so again, we have Jon Stewart and Hal Jordan back on Earth, and we've got Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner, you know, out in space. Now, the other half of this is, remember, Mongol is as intelligent as he is powerful. And that's one of the things that makes him so dangerous is because he is so capable. And so where some individuals would have, you know, would have received a Yellow Lantern ring and then would have immediately just like jumped out into the fray and started fighting Green Lanterns or something along those lines, Mongol takes a far different approach. Instead, he basically has a lantern ring spend 96 hours giving him all the information that the lantern ring knows. And so over the course of this 72 hour window, Mongol had learned about the origin of the Sinestro rings. He learned about the history of Sinestro himself. He learned about the Green Lanterns. He learned about the Blackest Night Prophecy. He'd learned all these different things. Basically everything we've covered up to this point, he was given all that information within, within you know, really like 96 hours or 70, 72 hours, whatever the case may be. And so the result is that the Guardians of the Universe begin to realize that all these different Sinestro core rings are basically taking off to the Vegas system. And the result is that they begin calling back together all these different members of the Green Lantern Corps. Now, for those of you guys who have read ahead, please do not spoil anything about the Vegas system. <laughs> because I know what you're thinking. Uh, do not spoil anything about the Vegas system, but what I will say is there's actually a reason why the Green Lanterns are not supposed to go to the Vegas system. There's actually a really cool basis behind that. But the funny thing about this is that they're actually instructed to do so. Now, again, we'll get into that once we get into like the whole, you know, prelude to Blackest Night and different things like that. Uh, but the idea here is that for the Guardians of the Universe, while there have been treaties and so on that have been struck over the course of their existence with different races and groups that exist across the universe, occasionally the Guardians of the universe will violate those treaties. And the reason for that is because the threat is just that credible. And so there's two things going on here. The first is that these Sinestro core rings are disappearing to the far side of the universe. And two, some individuals who are being given Sinestro core rings are just dying all of a sudden and nobody knows why. But what we end up doing is we transition back to Mongol. And what we end up finding out here is that Mongol himself is basically traveling around to these different individuals who have been, who have been given Sinestro core rings and offers them two options. The first is to either serve Mongol, or the second is to die. And a lot of them just refuse. They simply refuse to serve Mongol because remember, the Sinestro core rings bond themselves to what are basically bullies. And so if you're a person that's been more or less dominating a, a local village or a small territory or something along those lines, and then suddenly a Sinestro core ring appears to you, well, you're going to do what you do best. You're just going to start bullying people. And then if somebody else comes along and says, you work for me now, well, of course you're going to resist that. The difference here is that we have a guy who's basically on par with Superman in a lot of ways, who's now been given a Sinestro core ring. And so these average bad guys out there, these average bullies who have dominated these small little towns or something like that, while the Yellow Lantern ring does give them a whole host of abilities, they have neither the brains nor the, the forethought to be able to use them effectively, and they're easily dominated by Mongol. So the result is that he's been going around killing these different Sinestro Corps members and then taking their rings. Now, what this does is it basically picks up with the idea of these different individuals who are being sent out in groups for the purpose of tracking down these rings and what it is that's happening to these people. Now, also remember, Sodom Yacht is now Ion. And of course, if you missed the last video, Sodom Yacht was this character who was basically introduced as a what if scenario, like what if Superman got a Green Lantern ring? Because Sodom Yacht descends from a group that are basically called Daxamites, but they are a branch off of traditional Kryptonians. And so when exposed to a yellow sun, suddenly Sodom Yacht has all the powers of 
of Superman combine with a with a Green Lantern ring. Now the reason why he's Ion and the distinction between Ion and a regular Lantern is that Sodom Yacht is basically imbued with pure willpower with the Ion entity, and of course the Ion entity is a physical manifestation of the emotion of willpower. So again, that's how all this stuff really kind of comes together, and we'll see that more over the course of the Green Lantern mythos. And of course Parallax, the entity that represents fear, that you know again Ion is the entity that represents will, and we'll see things like the Bull, which is the entity that represents your know, rage for the Red Lantern cores and so on and so forth. But the fact remains here that with Ion and Orisia, I think it is, that are basically traveling to, you know, these different uh, Lantern locations and so on and so forth, the other members of the Lantern Corps are coming across these, basically like these giant body parts, limbs and so on, that belong to just different members of the Sinestro Corps who were defeated, who were dismembered, so on and so forth, only for us to find out Mongol has captured Orisia and, uh, and Sodom Yacht and has basically bestowed upon them these Black Mercy plants. Now remember, these uh, Black Mercy plants are what it is that makes Mongol such a dangerous foe and differentiates him from the other members of, you know, really the Sinestro Corps or really any other villain that exists out there in the realm of DC Comics. And the reason why I say this is because, remember, the Black Mercy plants, as we talked about in our DC Rebirth video about Trinity, basically were bonded to a host, and in turn, that host would enter this kind of dream state. They would basically experience this whole, uh, this whole illusion with no real idea of what was going on around them. And so the result of this is that we actually end up finding out that with Orisia and with uh, with Sodom Yacht being taken away, that normally it's supposed to be this kind of happy experience. You go through these dreams and you have these incredible experiences. You basically live out this almost perfect life. But instead, Orisia and Sodom Yacht are experiencing absolute nightmares. And so again, this is kind of a cool moment because what this does is it basically comes back and it goes through this basis behind the mercy plan, its, its origin, how it all comes together, so on and so forth. And so when the other Green Lanterns are able to jump in, you know, and, and rescue Sodom Yacht, and rescue Orisia, again, it's basically this idea that there's like this Mother Mercy, more or less. I guess this Black Mercy Prime, so to speak, that's giving birth to all these different plants that Mongols been using. And so what we end up finding out here is that where Mongols going through and again, basically taking all these Black Mercy seedlings, firing them, you know, into the universe for the purpose of just more or less taking people over, that he's essentially gone through and modified, or at least he's uh, benefiting from these modified uh, Black Mercy plants in the sense that the Black Mercy plants, where they're supposed to instill people with, you know, happy experiences and instead are forcing them to experience a massive amount of fear. The overarching goal of Mongol is to basically force everybody in the universe to feel fear and in turn empower himself with this virtually unrivaled level of power that nobody else could begin to grasp. And so the result is that where the Green Lanterns go through and they start freeing Sodom Yacht and so on and so forth, that the back, uh, Black Mercy plant basically speaks directly to them. The Mother Mercy plant basically says that originally it was designed for the purpose of making death an easy passing. That those beings who experienced death, getting ready to pass over, they would basically be imbued with these plants and they wouldn't experience the horrific turning, the, you know, the horrific circumstances under their own death, meaning they wouldn't suffer pain and different things like that. Instead, they would basically pass on with no real uh, impact on what it is that was happening to them. Instead, what ended up happening is the first Mongol to come along and grab these Black mercy plants and then basically started screwing with them and started modifying them and turning into uh, turning them into something that could be used for evil. And so the result is that he intends to, again, basically blanket the universe in fear and empower himself. Now, the reason why this story matters so much and the reason why this is such an important aspect is because, again, much like the stories that we saw where, you know, you'd have like Hal Jordan Most Wanted, kind of this one-off story that existed out there by themselves, what this also does is it basically lays the groundwork for the rise of the Star Sapphires. Because remember, the Star Sapphire are basically the lantern cores that deal with love. They believe love is an extreme thing. We had talked about how Carol Ferris had, be tra uh, had been transformed into a star sapphire and then she was eventually freed from its control. This is going to see them come back and it's going to see them being one of the other lantern cores that are starting to rise to prominence. And so again, it's these small little things that are written into this story. It's these small little moments where we basically have this great big huge event that doesn't really seem to tie into anything and then it's just this little tidbit. Much like we saw with our previous lantern videos, you know, where it was basically the Justice League fighting alongside the Green Lantern against some force, and then suddenly a Sinestro Corps ring suddenly appears to Bruce Wayne and says, you know, look, you know, Bruce Wayne, you have the ability to instill great fear, uh, woke up to the Sinestro Corps, and then eventually just kind of abandons him, you know, after realizing that he had used a Green Lantern ring. But the fact remains here that with the Green Lanterns able to overcome these Black Mercy plants and effectively defeating Mongol, uh, this leads to his character just kind of being kept in stasis and being kept on the back burner. And the reason why is because once we start to get into the whole element of Black 
Darkest Night and different things like that, that he'll actually make a return, that he'll actually end up coming back. And the result is that he'll play a more significant role in the different stories that we see leading into Blackest Night and so on and so forth. Now, the other half of this is the, again, you know, Mother Mercy plan herself in the sense that she's actually inducted into the Green Lantern Corps because of the fact that she has the ability to lean to both sides. Where the Black Mercy plants have the ability to force people to experience utter fear and at the same time give people the ability to overcome fear, she's basically given a choice. Either she can choose a Yellow Lantern Ring or she can choose a Green Lantern Ring. And the, the result is that she ends up choosing a Green Lantern Ring and, and joining the Green Lantern Corps. But again, this is really the end of the story. I mean, it's, there's not a whole lot here. Not a great big huge set of events. You know, a villain that was that's obscure to most people who don't read comic books uh, gets a Yellow Lantern Ring for a little while and then is ultimately defeated. But again, it's these moments, it's these small little panels, these small little segments, these stories that don't seem wildly interesting that become important later on down the line. Okay, so getting into Sins of the Star Sapphire, this is actually the first of three, I believe it's three preludes to Blackest Night. The next one is Rage of the Red Lanterns, and then the one after that is uh, Agent Orange, Larflees. Man, let me tell you something, dude, Larflees is so OP, it's not even funny. Dude, that guy is, dude, that guy's ridiculous. I mean, there's, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah like sons of the star sapphire is interesting because again when it comes to these prelude stories it's like these small little tidbits that kind of get thrown in here and there and really one of the most important characters that will really go into blackest night proper is actually a guy named sarek at least i think that's how you pronounce his name it's s-a-a-r-e-k regardless uh the story initially picks up with this guy and the reason why is because we actually join with this kind of funeral ceremony for green lanterns who have died in battle and this is actually really really cool because it shows us what happens whenever they perish. Now keep in mind, there are some Green Lanterns that die and they never recover their corpses. And so as far as I'm able to tell, this ceremony is never held for a corpse that can't be recovered. But for those Lanterns who do die in battle, they're given this very, you know, honorable thing in the sense that they're basically kind of stowed alongside all these other Lanterns who perished in conflict and their story will be recorded in the Book of Oa as one of the many instances when the Green Lanterns were able to achieve a great goal. Because remember, for those of you guys who were just now joining us, we're coming out of the Sinestro Corps war. And so, of course, that covered the story where uh, Thal Sinestro basically formed his own Lantern Corps and led to a massive war with the Green Lanterns that resulted in the Guardians of the Universe rewriting the Book of Oa to allow the Green Lanterns to kill both members of the Sinestro Corps as well as anybody who was an enemy of the Green Lanterns. And so, again, that was a huge change because it was something that we had never seen before. Now, with regards to Sarek himself, uh, his introduction comes by way of not really interrupting this funeral service so much as partaking of it and basically being met by the arrival of the caretaker himself, basically the guy who's sort of in charge of all these different, you know, funeral services and so on. And Sarek basically reveals that he has the telepathic ability to communicate with the dead. And this is why I say this is so important for Blackest Night, because as we know with Blackest Night, it's the resurrection of the dead. It's one of the reasons why I've timed a lot of this Green Lantern stuff so that Blackest Night will begin shortly before October and then run all the way through into Halloween. I thought it'd be kind of cool to do that, uh, to do like Green Lantern Blackest Night every Sunday all throughout October. I thought it'd be kind of a, a cool little thing. But the fact remains here that with Sarek, uh, his presence here is really one of intrigue and mystery more so than anything else. Because remember, lanterns don't usually display a power like this. Green lantern rings complement the existing powers of, you know, whatever being gets a green lantern ring. But there haven't really been any instances when a lantern crops up and says, well, I can talk to the dead because now it becomes a questionable thing. Now, the other half of this is what's going on with regards to uh, Kyle Rayner and Guy Gardner. Because remember, after the events of Sinestro Corps War, their idea was that they wanted to open a bar. <laughs> <laughs> which is actually pretty cool. It's a pretty cool thing to just kind of open a bar on Oa. But what they end up doing is talking about the whole idea of like Mongol and so on and so forth. Mongol being a guy who had basically attained uh, several yellow lantern rings, but had been handed over to the Black Mercy plants to basically be consumed, to quite literally be physically digested. Now that's one of the reasons why we cover that story, because going into things like this, they'll touch back on that. And I wanted to be able at the very least to just kind of say, hey, look, here's where that video is. It's in the Green Lantern playlist. You're welcome to check it out. But what we end up finding out is that Mongol has basically escaped his captivity. And so what that means is that now we have a guy who in a lot of ways is on par with Superman in terms of his strength and so on that has five Sinestro core rings. So it's kind of crazy in terms of the power that he possesses. But he actually won't play a very big role here. Again, this is Sins of the Star Sapphires. And so this is designed to focus more on the Star Sapphire cores and the Green Lantern more so than anything else. But the cool thing about this is that it also hints at the idea that someone is traveling around and basically killing off all of the, uh, you know, the various parents that belong to 
members of the uh, of the Green Lantern Corps. And again, this is kind of a big deal because despite the fact that Thal Sinestro was defeated and the, the Sinestro Corps was defeated, they weren't destroyed in their entirety. They're all still very much alive and the rings are still going out and pursuing new recruits for the Sinestro Corps. And so with the idea of someone traveling around and killing the parents of recruits who are part of the Green Lantern Corps, this presents a very dangerous situation. And the reason for this is because of the fact that with them fearing for the lives of their parents, the fact that the Sinestro Corps is rooted in fear means that they could easily be pulled away from the Green Lanterns, inducted into the Sinestro Corps, and bolster the Sinestro Corps' numbers. But of course, what we end up doing is we basically pick up with Sarek after the fact that all these different eyes have just kind of been dropped down onto these members of the Green Lantern Corps when they learned their loved ones were being killed. And Sarek basically is able to, to go through the, the memories, so to speak, or the very least speak to the dead through these eyes, and then in turn gain the identity of the person who's doing this. Now again, this is where the plot begins to thicken a little bit. And the reason for that is because of the fact that once the Green Lanterns are able to sort out who it is that's committing these actions, the question now becomes, who are these guys going to be? The other half of this is that because of the fact that so many of these new recruits have basically lost their parents, because they're not really forged in the fires of battle and therefore don't really have the willpower necessary to overcome virtually any and all fear, and the fact that they are so susceptible to the Sinestro Corps, they're stripped of their Green Lantern rings and they're basically thrown in isolation. Now again, this is one of the big failings of the Green Lantern Corps, and that's one of the things that we're going to see at the, you know, once we get towards the conclusion of the story. But before we jump into that, we actually jump in with a character named Ice. Now, normally we wouldn't really jump into this too much just because of the fact that she's here for a little bit. She talks to Guy Gardner for a little while, the two of them think about moving in, and then that's it. But Ice actually gives us a chance to sort of talk about this background with Guy Gardner because Guy Gardner is a character that we haven't really discussed too much. We really haven't had a reason to outside of whatever it is that he's doing in any particular story that goes on. But Guy Gardner, really his, his rise in popularity came by way of Justice League International. But the idea of Justice League International was to basically take superheroes who couldn't normally sell their own comics, throw them onto a team, have them led by Batman in order to boost the team's popularity, and then sell comics. And it performed exceedingly well. It actually did a, did a really good job. Guy Gardner was, for the most part, headstrong. He was a guy who just got in a fight with Batman, Batman punched him out, different things like that. But he also started forming relationships. And one of these relationships was with a girl named Ice, a girl named Tora Olaf's daughter, I think is what her last name is. But she's very similar in terms of Iceman, in terms of, you know, with, with regards to what her abilities are and so on and so forth, the ability to kind of manipulate ice and snow and so on and so forth. The idea was that this all really came out of the aftermath of Sinestro Core War. With regards to Guy Gardner and uh, Ice herself, the two of them had this sort of on-again, off-again relationship, but following Sinestro Core War and him traveling back to Earth, the idea was to basically rekindle this romance that they had had at some point along the line. And initially the response was, well, give me a little bit of time and we'll get things sorted out, which resulted in Guy Gardner basically retreating back to Oa for about, about a month or so in order to, for the two of them to basically get together and to have a date. Again, switching back over to, uh, you know, this being that's going around and killing these various parents that belong to members of the Green Lantern Corps, this was really more of a moral assault, more so than a physical assault. And the reason for this is because, again, historically speaking, when it comes to new recruits, they're very inexperienced. They don't really know how to deal with fear and, you know, the Sinestro Corps and so on and so forth, but they're still also very easy to sway. And so the goal of these creatures, at least as it seems on the surface, was to go through, kill their parents, make these kids orphans, and in turn, embolden them with fear, and then make them members of the Sinestro Corps. But using the powers of Sarek, what ends up happening here is they not only learn that this one being has been doing this, but there have been a multitude of others who are all basically of the same race, who are all identical. Now, of course, this leads to the Green Lanterns tracking them down, killing them, and, uh, you know, that's really the end of that, or at the very least, throwing them into science cells, and that's really the end of that. But the way that this begins to lead into the whole concept of, uh, of Blackest Night, Knight comes by way of the Scarred Guardian. Now, as far as I'm aware, this Guardian doesn't actually have a name. They're just referred to as the Scarred Guardian. But the Guardian basically speaks directly with Sarek and just says, look, because of the fact that you can speak directly to the dead, your new assignment that you will tell nobody about is to go and find the corpse of the Anti-Monitor and find out what in the world is going on. Now, again, the reason why this matters is because following the events of Sinestro Corps War, one of the things that the Guardians have been questioning is why Sinestro had cropped up the way he did. And the other question was, what happened? happened to the Anti-Monitor, because remember, the Anti-Monitor is kind of like this harbinger of death for the multiverse, but when the Anti-Monitor had basically been defeated, or at the very least when the events of Sinestro Corps War had come to an end, the Anti-Monitor had been whisked away, and then was effectively turned into a central power battery, or at least that seemed to be the case. And so the idea of the Guardians of the Universe is to find out what happened to this guy, what in the world happened to the Anti-Monitor, and where did he go? And so what we end up doing here is we jump into Sins of the Star Sapphire proper, and we basically just kind of pick up with, you know, regards to Mongol still going on his rampage, that is to say, leaving the planet of the Black Mercies and then just taking off 
to the far side of the universe or whatever. But along the way, he comes across a couple and basically destroys their ship in the process as well as kills one of them. Now, again, this sets the stage for the idea of the Star Sapphires, and we'll talk a little bit more about them here in a second. But at the moment, one of the other things that we start focusing on here is the idea that some Green Lanterns out there are engaged in relationships with one another, whether they're guys and guys, girls and girls, guys and girls, whatever the case may be, they're all forming their own relationships, their own, you know, connections and so on and so forth. And some of them have gone so far as to procreate. Now, this was literally something the Green Lanterns were just given free reign on. There was really no limit to what it was that Green Lanterns could do with their own relationships. They could form friendships, they could form romantic attachments, so on and so forth. But in truth, when it came to the Green Lanterns, this was something that actually helped to forge willpower. This is something that gave them a reason to fight. Because when you're a Green Lantern and you're a parent, if you're not fighting for anything, you're fighting for your, for your kid. And so it always gave you the extra motivation that you needed to keep on keeping on. What we also end up finding out here is that in addition to these you know aliens that have been captured and have been killing parents of Green Lantern Corps members we also actually find out that someone's been going around and killing the parents of Green Lantern babies and then taking those babies away but the introduction of the Star Sapphires starts to come by way of this particular woman whose husband was basically killed when Mongol attacked their ship now this woman's name is actually Miri but she's met with the Star Sapphires and this begins to bolster the Star Sapphire ranks remember we already talked about the whole introduction of Star Sapphire Sapphires in the Jeff Johns Green Lantern run when Carol Ferris was brought in as one of their ranks. What seems to be going on here is that where previously the Star Sapphires just wanted like a queen and they sent out this gem that would basically grab someone and make them the queen. What they're doing now is they're creating rings. And so the result is that these rings are now being sent out into the universe for the purpose of grabbing people. The difference here is that unlike the Green Lanterns where these rings were made and then just dispersed across the cosmos and sent everywhere, instead the Star Sapphires are far more conservative about how their rings get sent out and who it is that's able to use them. And so the result is that despite, you know, Guy Gardner and Ice trying to have a bit of a relationship together, ultimately he's recalled back to the Guardians of the Universe and basically told that he, alongside Soda Miyad and a handful of others, are going to lead the Guardians on a mission to the Star Sapphire home planet of Zamoron. Now again, for those of you guys who are new to the whole uh, Jeff Johns Green Lantern thing, if you're just now joining our videos, with regards to the Star Sapphires, they were actually Guardians of the Universe at one point along the line. The difference here is that when the Guardians basically removed emotion from themselves, some of the female members of the Guardians disagreed with that and believed that love was the way by which life could continue on in any form of normalcy. And so the result was that they broke off and they traveled to the planet Zamoron, where they found that the love between a man and a woman resulted in the formation of this crystal of sorts. Now, this crystal was basically used by the Zamorons to form their central power battery and begin calling themselves the Star Sapphires. And this is what led into Carol Fair the girlfriend of Hal Jordan being brought in as one of the Star Sapphires way back in the 1950s, 1960s, or no, not even then, maybe it was 1970s, whatever the case may be, when she was rolled in into the uh, into the Green Lantern mythos, as well as, you know, her return and, and so on and so forth. But what we also end up finding out here is that where some of the members of the Sinestro Corps, where these rings had basically been captured by the Zamorans and so on and so forth, some of the female members had been taken by the Star Sapphires and brought in for the purpose of being reconditioned. And that's the nature of the Star Sapphires. What they basically do, because they believe that love is the absolute thing that can conquer all, the goal is to basically find individuals who are devoid of love or who they believe need love and can also serve as a member of their uh, of their Lantern Corps, bring them in, and then effectively recondition them. And that's what they're doing with members of the Sinestro Corps, these female members that they've discovered. They basically say, look, they're filled with hate, they're filled with fear, so on and so forth, but we can change them. We can fill them with love. And when we do, they will be members of the Star Sapphires. But that's why I say, they don't just send out rings all willy-nilly to anybody who wants them. They don't just stand on a street corner and just say, you get a ring and you get a ring and you get a ring. Instead, they're a lot more conservative in terms of who gets them. And so again, it's really kind of a cool scenario because what we end up finding out here is that there's basically irreconcilable differences. The goal of the Guardians of the Universe coming here was to basically say, look, you can't just go around creating your own Lantern Corps because you'll destabilize the universe. Love mutates, love changes. Sure, two people fall in love and then somewhere along the line, they may end up breaking up. And because because one of them is so in love, they go crazy and kill the other because they don't want the other person to be with anybody else. Just because something starts out good doesn't mean that it's going to stay good. And that's the whole basis behind the Guardians of the Universe devoiding themselves of emotion, is to basically make the case that just because something can be a certain way doesn't mean that it should be a certain way. But this is when we start to get into the nature of the fact that the Guardians of the Universe basically become their own enemies. Now switching back over to who this person is that's going around and kidnapping these kids, it's actually a character by the name of Crib. And as far as I'm aware, this is the first intro 
introduction of Crib into the whole idea of the Green Lantern mythos. But what Crib's been basically doing is going around killing off the parents uh, who were basically Green Lanterns and then taking their kids with the intention of whisking these kids away and then raising them to become Sinestro Corps members to hate Green Lanterns. Now, this is not as though Crib is functioning in subservience to Sinestro. This is one of those instances where you see some existing ruler who's basically defeated and then petty warlords start rising up. And for the most part, that's pretty standard. When Thal Sinestro was still around before he was captured by the Green Lantern Corps, uh, he was the absolute ruler. He was the guy who was running the show. But with his defeat, there was no one in control. And so what this did is it allowed different members of the Sinestro Corps to go around and start practicing their own agendas. And so this is really just kind of an example of how the Sinestro Corps is fragmented, but they're all still extremely dangerous. And what it is that makes Crib so dangerous is the fact that Crib can secrete these pheromones that will basically force other people to exist under its control. And so again, getting back into the Guardians themselves, the reason why they really become their own enemy in this particular story is because when they look at the Star Sapphires and they look at what the Star Sapphires are doing, they look at the actions that they're committing themselves to in terms of spreading love all throughout the universe and so on and so forth. Because the Guardians of the universe consider love to be a weakness and a failing and something that will inevitably lead somebody down the path of becoming a member of the Sinestro Corps, they effectively banish all relationships among Green Lanterns. And so anybody who's a member of the Green Lantern Corps cannot be in any kind of a romantic relationship whatsoever. They cannot date, they cannot procreate, none of that stuff. They have to remain totally isolated from one another. And the result of that is going to be exactly what you expect. But the fact remains here with regards to uh, Kyle Rayner and these various guys fighting against the character of Crib after realizing what it is that's going on, this coincides with Miri basically coming along and officially being inducted into the uh, Star Sapphire Corps. And so the result is that her job is to effectively go out, find people who are trying to destroy love anywhere in the universe, and then bring them back to the planet of Zamoron. That's the nature of the Star Sapphires. It's almost like the Sinestro Corps, when a person is so strong that all they do is instill fear or something like that. They rule with an iron fist or they make other people terrified of them. They're effectively a bully. A Sinestro Corps ring will suddenly pop up and say, such and such, you have the ability to instill great fear. Welcome to the Sinestro Corps, that kind of a thing. The Zamorons will basically pop up with a ring that says, you know, you have the ability to create great love or whatever in the world that it is, and then whisk them off to become a member of the, uh, of the Star Sapphires. And so the result is that where things are popping off pretty readily back with how, you know, Kyle Rayner and Crib and all these different guys and so on and so forth, there are two things that happen here. The first is that Kyle Rayner's willpower effectively overrides the control that Crib puts on him. This is yet another instance of really detailing the willpower of Kyle Rayner. There is a reason why he was the host of the willpower entity when he was Ion, because he is, in a lot of ways, the living embodiment of will. Now, of course, this is a role that'll be passed on to Hal Jordan and the New 52 going into DC Rebirth, but at this moment right now, in terms of how he acts, in terms of his total lack of fear, in terms of his ability to maintain his mental faculties in almost any situation, Kyle Rayner is effectively the embodiment of willpower. And this coincides with the arrival of Miri as a member of the Star Sapphires. And so again, because Star Sapphire rings are best utilized against Red Lantern rings, which they can basically shut down if they make a member of the Red Lanterns feel love, and because they cannot be affected by uh, the Orange Lantern ring of Avarice, while they're not the most effective against uh, Sinestro Corps rings, they're not like super effective against them, the actions of Miri here actually helps to sort of conquer uh, Crib just because of the fact that Miri's presence is indicative of the fact that Crib is basically trying to separate a mother from its baby. And so the result is that with the help of Miri as a Star Sapphire, the Green Lanterns are basically able to defeat Crib, and the result is that the baby is born pretty healthy, you know, or as healthy as a baby can be under this particular circumstance. But following this, what Miri also does is she actually invokes the desires of both Kyle Rayner as well as uh, Saranic Natu, of course, the daughter of Sinestro. She basically says, look, the two of you all need love. Love is a necessity. Love is something that has to exist. And this, again, is kind of a funny situation because what this does is it highlights the nature of Green Lanterns. Green Lanterns are not like the Guardians of the Universe. The Guardians of the Universe purge themselves of all emotion. But the Green Lanterns have not purged themselves of emotion. They feel anger. They feel love. They feel hate. They feel fear, which is why so many Green Lanterns are always in danger of falling to the Sinestro Corps, falling to the Red Lanterns because of the fact that they feel emotion. And so the result is that Miri's, you know, Miri simply says, if you do not believe that love is necessary, then simply look into the gem of the Star Sapphire. I don't know what it'll show you and neither of you know what it'll show the other. All you know is what you see. And we're not told explicitly what it is that Kyle Rayner or Saronic see. But the idea is that given what we, what ends up happening later on with the two of them kind of bumping uglies, that uh, they end up getting together more or less. They just kind of see each other in love. But the biggest action of this, the biggest result of this particular circumstance, the fall 
fallout of the Guardians of the Universe effectively banishing love between the Green Lanterns is that there are countless Green Lanterns, not really countless, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of Green Lanterns that abandon their post. They basically say, if I'm not allowed to be in a relationship with a person that I love, so long as I'm a Green Lantern, then I'm not going to be a Green Lantern. And again, this makes sense because remember, not everybody who was inducted into the Green Lantern Corps did it willingly. Not only that, a lot of people came from their own lives. They basically had their own wives, their own husbands, they had their own families. They undertook that role because they felt a responsibility to keep the universe protected. And the power of the Green Lantern would ensure that their families protected more so than they could just by using whatever natural talents they had. But their loyalty is to their friends and family, not to the Green Lanterns. And so what ends up happening here is that again, because the fact that they're faced with this choice to either continue their relationships or abandon the Green Lantern Corps, they abandon the Green Lantern Corps. And this reduces their number by a pretty good margin in a pretty short amount of time. Now those numbers will bolster and those numbers will go back up. But in the interim, Blackest Night is coming. And so the result is that the War of Light <laughs> is going to be something to behold. It's going to be absolutely bonkers by the time it's all said and done. But at this point, we start to get out of the realm of the stories that are interesting, but not the greatest. And we start to get into the stories that are really good, like Rage of the Red Lanterns and like Agent Orange. Oh man, dude, I love Larfleys. <laughs> <laughs> but let me know down in the in the comment section because I'm kind of curious. Let me know in the comment section which Lantern Corps is your favorite because I'm kind of curious. I imagine people, I imagine a lot of people are going to say red. Um, I imagine a lot of people are going to be like, yeah, man, those red lanterns, man, they're just pissed off all the time. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, so as I'd mentioned when we started doing really everything after Sinestro Core War, that there was something like five or six different preludes to Blackest Night because Blackest Night is such a huge event. It's like the War of Light. So it's Blackest Night, it's Brightest Day. There's a lot of stuff that goes on there. But this is actually a prelude to Rage of the Red Lanterns, which is a prelude to Blackest Night. So this is like a prelude to a prelude. <laughs> but it gets pretty cool in terms of how all this unfolds because what this does is this deals with the early formation of the Red Lantern Corps, but it really also deals with this coming together of the War of Light. Now, the cool thing about this is that this initially focuses on the nature of individuals who are basically becoming what are called Alpha Lanterns. And Alpha Lanterns are actually a pretty cool concept. And the reason why is because these are basically policemen for the Green Lanterns themselves. And we'll actually get into that here in a second. What we end up doing is we actually pick up with Sinestro. Now, for those of you guys who were just now joining us, Sinestro Corps War was really really like the last big event that we did. And that's really the only thing you need to know in order to be able to follow this bit of a story here. But what ended up happening is that the former Green Lantern Sinestro had basically long since defected from the Green Lantern Corps after basically being shunned aside and then making himself a Yellow Lantern, only for us to find out that he eventually came along and formed his own Lantern Corps called the Sinestro Corps. Now, initially, the arrival of the Sinestro Corps came by way of these small little things that would pop up here and there. It wasn't any great big huge event that just suddenly happened. It was just these small little little tidbits, these small little teasers that would crop up every once in a while. Suddenly a lantern ring would appear before Bruce Wayne and it would say, Batman, you have the ability to instill great fear. Welcome to the Sinestro Corps or something along those lines. But what ended up happening is that with this Sinestro Corps war, while the Sinestro Corps was defeated, the overarching goal of Sinestro was not to eliminate the Green Lanterns in their entirety, although it would have been nice if he had. The goal was to irrevocably change the nature of the Green Lanterns so they no longer serve their purpose anymore. Now, for those of you guys who are reading Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps in DC Rebirth, or you were reading Green Lanterns prior to DC Rebirth, then you know the long game that Sinestro's playing. And really to kind of offer a bit of a spoiler for what it is that he's doing later on down the line, at least, you know, this is stuff that we'll cover, I don't know, in like six or seven months. It'll be a while before we get there. But the idea was that the Green Lanterns always existed as a peacekeeping force. And so they didn't really have the ability to kill people. They would simply just use their rings to take them prisoner and then whisk the bad guys away. That was the only role they played. But but now that the Green Lanterns have the ability to use lethal force, then what this means is that people will start to look at the Green Lanterns in a different eye. They'll begin to look at them as killers. And so all Sinestro has to do is sit back and let the court of public opinion play its role. And ultimately, people will begin to turn on the Green Lanterns. That's ultimately what ends up happening with regards to Sinestro uh, taking over the universe, really, you know, using the Sinestro core as his own personal army, different things like that. But again, the funny thing about this is this hits home at the nature that Sinestro effectively won, that he won the Sinestro 
Sokor War. Sure, he was taken prisoner, most of his guys were killed, but at the end of the day, he won because the goal of Sinestro was to spread fear. And that's exactly what he did. He instilled fear in a Lantern Corps that otherwise existed to overcome fear. And so it's this really, really good example of if you're trying to conquer a country, you don't invade the country. That's not what you do. You don't go into a country, invade it, and call it a day. What you do is you get the government of that country to turn its guns on its citizens. And then eventually it'll turn into an uprising, a revolt. And when that country's at its weakest, then you conquer it. That's exactly how Sinestro plays this stuff out. And so what we end up doing here is joining a handful of different people who are basically coping with the loss of different Green Lanterns that had perished during the Sinestro Core War. But one of the most important characters here, and really the star of this particular story, is a girl named Lyra, one of the members of the Lost Lanterns. Now, the reason why I say Lost Lanterns, if you're just now joining us or if you've been watching this for a little while, bear with me for a second for the, for the new folks. Back in 1993, when Hal Jordan became a bad guy, he was basically possessed by the Parallax Entity, which is to say the entity that represents all, all fear that exists in the universe. The result was that Hal Jordan became a bad guy. He laid waste to the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps. It was believed that he had killed them all. But what we ended up finding out is that some of the original Green Lanterns that were believed to have been killed by Hal Jordan actually survived. And they were being held captive by Cyborg Superman and the Manhunters. Of course, you'll find all this stuff in our Green Lantern playlist if you wanna, if you wanna get caught up. But the idea here was that these Lanterns who were previously believed to have been dead and then discovered to have been alive are what are referred to as the Lost Lanterns. But the thing that differentiates them from all the other Lanterns that are out there is that while they are basically making their return, they're essentially veterans. They had been fighting as Green Lanterns for quite some time. Not only that, they all harbor just this extreme hatred for Hal Jordan because the last memory they have of him, he turned against them all and tried to kill him. But the character of Lyra is one of the Lost Lanterns. She's experienced nothing but just trial and torment. One of the things they talk about here in a little while is that her father had basically committed suicide. And the result of this is that with her father having been a renegade, having basically been a shunned lantern, lost his honor, Lyra was carrying this around. No matter where she went as a green lantern, no matter what she did, people always saw her as the daughter of a shunned lantern. And so with that legacy following her around, combined with the fact that she'd been betrayed by Hal Jordan and then now lost one of her fellow lost lanterns, her life is literally in turmoil. And so what ends up happening here is that on the journey back to the home planet of Kihon, where they're basically taking his body back to his family, once the Lost Lanterns arrive, they basically end up finding out that every single person had been killed. Now, this had been done by a character named Eamon Soar. Now, the cool thing about this is that if you are pretty new to Green Lantern, Eamon Soar is the son of Abin Soar, and Abin Soar was the guy who crash-landed on Earth and basically told his ring, find a new host, and his ring found Hal Jordan. And so because of this, Eamon Soar always believed that he should have been the heir to his father's ring. Now, when it comes to the Green Lantern mythos, that's not unprecedented. It's not like Eamon Sword just kind of came out of nowhere with this belief system. That's happened quite a few times. When it comes to different uh, different lanterns that are out there, I believe Tomar Ray was the father and Tomar II is the son. But when it comes to the different green lanterns that are out there, there are times where a green lantern will perish in battle and then their offspring will take up the mantle. And so again, it's kind of a cool scenario and, and Eamon Sword believed that he should have been in line for his father's ring. The result is that Hal Jordan got it instead and Eamon Sword had been consistently plotting ways to basically bring down Hal Jordan. Now, all of this coincided with the emergence of the Sinestro Corps and Eamon Soar being given a ring. But what this did is it led to its most logical conclusion when Eamon Soar basically is the one that killed the entire family of Kihon and then Lyra, in her anger and her rage, basically lashes out and kills Eamon Soar. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. With the Sinestro Corps, despite the fact that they had these rings that allowed them to do all kinds of different things, when it comes to the different cores that exist in the DC mythos, they all exist to feed off of emotion. So the Green Lanterns feed on willpower. So long as there's somebody out there who's willing to stand up, you know, and say, I'm not afraid, then there will be willpower in the universe. At the same time, so long as there's somebody there who says, oh my God, I'm so scared that things might go bad, there will always be fear in the universe. As long as there's somebody who's angry, as long as there's somebody who loves, as long as there's life, as long as there's death, those aspects of the emotional spectrum will always exist and the cores will always be there. And so because of this, Eamon Sor believes that he could basically turn himself into a martyr. That what he could do is he could allow himself or he could go through, kill the family of Kihon, and then other members of the Sinestro Corps would see how this impacted existing Green Lanterns and in turn, take up the same task and literally just start killing off families of Green Lanterns who exist. Again, sowing chaos, reaping war, you know, guerrilla warfare tactics against a far more organized and structured Lantern Corps, especially considering that the Sinestro Corps does not have their leader 
Peter Sinestro because he's currently held in prison. And so with the death of Eamon Sore, what happens here is his ring basically just takes off to seek out a viable host. It ends up attempting to bond itself to the Scarecrow. Now, the funny thing about this is that this is actually a teaser of things to come because the Scarecrow is going to play a pretty cool role once we start getting into like Blackest Night and Brightest Day and different things like that. Where the ring initially appears to him with the intention of bonding itself, of course, Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart show up. They basically save the day and nothing happens. You know, the Scarecrow doesn't end up getting a ring. But what this does is this leads into the trial of Lyra. When it came to the Sinestro Corps War, one of the major laws that was basically implemented by the Guardians of the Universe was that those individuals who are members of the Green Lantern Corps have authorization to use lethal force against members of the Sinestro Corps. And that's literally the argument that Lyra uses. She says, who cares why I killed him? What, he, what matters is that he was a villain. You know, he did some terrible things. He killed the family of Kihon. He deserved to die. And so I killed him. Now, her argument is not without merit. Let's say, for example, she didn't kill Eamon Sur. And let's say that Eamon Sur was captured for his crimes. He was brought back to Oa and then he escaped. Well, that would mean he would go right back to doing what he was doing before. He would go right back to killing people. Why sacrifice the lives of others? That's basically the argument that's being made, uh, you know, from the Green Lanterns, from the Guardians of the Universe is, hey, look, you know, justice is the most important thing. And so, yes, this guy killed children, but he deserves a fair trial just like everybody else. No, he doesn't. He gave up that right when he murdered a family. He sacrificed that. That's the choice that he made. He looked at the consequences of his own actions and said, if I commit this crime, then there's a good chance somebody's going to come and kill me and I don't care. Why give that chance? Why go to a three-year-old or a four-year-old or an 80-year-old woman and say, hey, look, yeah, there's a chance you're going to die and Eamon Sewer is going to be the one to kill you and it sucks that that's going to happen. But you know, that's just the price we pay when it comes to justice. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It doesn't work that way. That guy made a choice. He paid the price. And the result is that the Green Lanterns effectively turn on Lyra. Now, what this also does is this brings in something called the Alpha Lanterns. And the reason for this is because the, the actions of Lyra throw into sharp relief that there are going to be Green Lanterns out there who are going to basically look at the rules as they exist and then interpret them different ways. And that's the problem is that these rules are not absolute. These rules are basically written in a way where anybody can look at them. You can show the rules to five different people and give them each a circumstance and they'll interpret the rules in different ways. The law says lethal force can be used against a member of the Sinestro Corps. It does not say lethal force can be used against a member of the Sinestro Corps but only if they're trying to attack you. It doesn't say that. And so in truth, she has all legitimate means to make this case. What the Guardians basically do is that instead of coming along and saying, okay, we are going to make a law and then we're going to add stipulations to that law for every conceivable circumstance that could possibly exist, what they end up doing is they come along and they create the Alpha Lanterns. And the Alpha Lanterns serve the purpose of basically being field police. They're the ones that show up. If a Green Lantern goes out and commits something they shouldn't do, but technically speaking, they fall within the confines of the law, the Alpha Lanterns will respond and the Alpha Lanterns will analyze the situation. They'll be the ones to basically decide whether this Lantern was right or wrong. Now, the question has to be asked, how does this fix anything? What's different from the Alpha Lantern showing up and saying, yep, they're right, to just another arbitrary Green Lantern showing up and saying, no, they're wrong. The reason why this matters is because if you're new to the whole Green Lantern myth, Back when the Guardians of the Universe first tried to create order, tried to instill order across the universe, they created what were called the Manhunters. And the Manhunters were basically these robots that were tasked with the purpose of keeping the universe safe. The problem with this is that the Manhunters programming eventually went awry. They basically became bad guys. They just started cutting a swath through the universe, killing all different forms of life, all in the name of order and justice. And so eventually the, the Guardians of the Universe had to do away with the Manhunters and in turn began creating the Green Lantern Corps under the idea that Green Green Lanterns would be able to use their own experiences, their own understanding of right and wrong, and then decide what action needs to be taken, all of which was predicated on the fact that before Sinestro Corps War, Green Lanterns couldn't kill. And so the idea that Green Lanterns can kill complicates everything. And so what ends up happening here is that where individuals are basically chosen to become Alpha Lanterns, and Jon Stewart's one of them, Jon Stewart actually turns them down. Jon Stewart actually says, no, he doesn't want to be any part of that. And the reason why is because the Guardians say the Alpha Lanterns will exist 
exist to basically serve the purpose of enforcing the 10 laws that the guardians of the universe have put into creation. The problem with this is that only two of those laws are known. And so those individuals who sign up to become Alpha Lanterns don't know what other laws they're going to be forced to implement. They could very well be forced to implement laws that say it's illegal to fly from one side of the universe to the other on a Thursday. We have no idea what these laws are going to be. I mean, there wouldn't be anything that ridiculous, but you guys understand what I'm saying. They're basically signing up to enforce rules that they don't know anything about. What the Alpha Lanterns do is basically stand as this sort of combination of machinery and biological organisms. They're effectively cyborgs, or at least they seem to be that way. Now, the reason why this is so cool is because Green Lanterns traditionally, which is to say Hal Jordan, John Stewart, Kyle Rayner, Guy Gardner, they have to charge their rings. Their rings will run low. The reason why this is important is because with the Alpha Lanterns, they don't have that problem. The Alpha Lanterns mainline the central power battery. And so it's like the difference between you having a remote control that runs off batteries and having a remote control that plugs in from the wall. At the end of the day, they do serve the same purpose, but one is not going to run out of power as long as you have power going to your house. And so what ends up happening here is that where Lyra just immediately loses it, when everybody basically says, okay, look, you know, you are effectively guilty. We're going to hold you accountable for your crime crimes, the Alpha Lanterns begin the process of essentially arresting her. But in this particular circumstance, the Alpha Lanterns begin to demonstrate this sort of totalitarian position where it's almost like they just start executing, or at least they intend to execute, Lyra on the spot. Now, this is important because what this does is it sets the stage for the possibility of the Guardians of the Universe repeating their mistakes again. The Guardians of the Universe have consistently shown themselves to be extremely intelligent and very capable. They're able to make mistakes just like everybody else. They can't see the future. They don't know everything about everything. And the Alpha Lanterns are a perfect example of that. Creating a police force within the Green Lanterns with virtually no oversight is going to end in nothing good. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. And so what ends up happening here is that with the first law having already been written, what the Guardians do is they come along and they basically write in stone the second law. And the second law is that anybody who is an enemy of the Green Lantern Corps will be met with lethal force by the Green Lanterns. Now, this is important because what ended up happening is during Sinestro Corps, the Guardians of the Universe said lethal forces is authorized against the Sinestro Corps. That was it. It was only against the Sinestro Corps. Now, again, this hits back home to the conversation that Hal Jordan has with Sinestro, where Sinestro says, I told you I was right. I told you that I won this war because now that the Green Lanterns can use lethal force against anybody who's an enemy of the Green Lantern, where does that stop? Is an enemy of the Green Lantern a person that's running for political office that disagrees with Green Lanterns? Is an enemy of the Green Lanterns a person standing on a street corner saying, I don't believe the Green Lanterns are right? Where do you draw this line? At what point do you say, yes, this person's an enemy, but they're not a mortal enemy. They're not going to actually do us any harm. You know, this allows the, the stage to be set for the Green Lanterns to be transformed from a peacekeeping force into a militaristic controlling force, effectively becoming exactly what Sinestro wanted them to be, where they used fear and they used force to maintain order across the universe, as opposed to allowing people to basically live their own lives. And so what ends up happening here is we basically pick up with Lyra as she's being transported back to her planet. Because again, when a person's found guilty of a crime like this in the Green Lanterns, they're basically just kicked out. That's really all it is. It's just you're banned from the Green Lantern Corps and you're sent back home. Now, for a lot of people, this is a big deal. Because remember, when a person's given a Green Lantern ring, a massive amount of power comes with that. The Green Lantern ring becomes as much their identity as it becomes a source of power. In this instance, that was the only way for Lyra to, at least as far as she perceived it, to regain the honor lost by her father. But being kicked out of the Green Lantern means she's now just the daughter of a father who was shamed and who was shunned for his actions as a renegade lantern and basically just kicked out of the court. And so because of this, in this moment when she just swears absolute vengeance against, you know, against anybody, you know, that that's considered to be an enemy of her or at least all the other members of the Sinestro Corps, she suddenly met with the arrival of a Red Lantern ring. And this marks chronologically the first time in DC Comics that the Red Lanterns actually make their appearance. The secret origin of Hal Jordan that we did earlier and when we started the whole Green Lantern thing, technically speaking, that happens after this. But the cool thing about this is that this is the first introduction of the Red Lanterns into DC. The first time that we actually see a Lantern Corps that's predicated on absolute pure and unadulterated rage. 
Oh my goodness, Rob Core. I woke up this morning, I had a leisurely breakfast of steak and eggs, I was watching World War Z, the book is still better than the movie, and we are getting ready to cover Rage of the Red Lanterns. So, this story is amazing. Oh my god, this is so good. Because this is like, I think it's this, and then it's Agent Orange, which is Larflees, and then we go into Blackest Night. So we've got like two weeks until we start Blackest Night, which I'm really kind of hyped about, because that story is insanely good. But for those of you guys who are just just now getting caught up with us here on, on our Green Lantern Sundays, I guess is what it is. The Green Lantern landscape so far has basically dealt with Sinestro Core War, which is to say the villain Thal Sinestro, a former Green Lantern who basically became corrupted by his power, falling and then forming his own Yellow Lantern Corps. This really led into a series of paradigm shifts where the Green Lanterns were always more of a peacekeeping force because of the violence of Sinestro, because his rings were not limited by the ability to kill like the Green Lantern rings were. They couldn't actually kill people. The Guardians of the Universe, the creators of the Green Lantern Corps, basically modified the rules of the rings so that Green Lanterns could now kill people. And this was the ultimate goal of, of Thal Sinestro, was to basically turn the Green Lanterns or at least begin the process of taking the universe's eye, how they perceive the Green Lanterns, and move it away from seeing the Green Lanterns as protectors to seeing the Green Lanterns as really more of like a police force, like this sort of army, you know, belonging to these all-powerful beings. And it would lead people down the path of coming to believe that the Green Lanterns were effectively paving the way for the Guardians of the Universe to take over the universe. That's not what was actually happening. All that Thal Sinestro needed was the belief that that's what was going to happen. Now, what this does is it shifts over to the Red Lanterns to Atrocitus. Now, Atrocitus is a character that we haven't really talked about since we cover the secret secret origin story of Hal Jordan the Green Lantern. But Atrocitus was formerly uh, a guy, I guess I think his name was Atros, who was formerly just a guy residing in Sector 666, just one of the many sectors that exist all throughout the universe. When it comes to DC Comics, the universe is divided into sections, into sectors. So think of the universe or think of the sectors of the universe as like neighborhoods, more or less, is the best way to think of it. But the idea here is that uh, when the Guardians of the Universe, before they created the Green Lanterns, they had what were called the Manhunters. The idea was that if there was going to be a peacekeeping force around the universe, then the best way to do that was to use robots, because robots were only governed by their programming. They weren't governed by emotion. They weren't governed by fear, rage, anger, wrath, any of those things. Now, this eventually led to the programming of the Manhunters going awry, and one of the first casualties of their screwed up programming was Sector 666. And at this time, the family of Atrocitus was basically destroyed in the conflict. Now, the reason why this matters is because what happened following this is Atrocitus was just set by absolute pure rage. Now, as we know, rage is one of the aspects of the emotional spectrum. Remember, when it comes to the whole Green Lantern mythos, the Blue Lantern Rings of Hope, the Orange Lantern Ring of Avarice or Greed, the Yellow Lantern Ring of Fear, they're all tied into the emotional spectrum. So long as there's an emotion of rage, so long as somebody in the universe is mad as hell, there will always be a source of energy for the Red Lanterns. And so because of this, a lot of what this early story really does is just kind of flesh out the nature of Atrocitus forming his own Red Lantern Corps. Now, again, all the really required in order for a person to be able to form a core is to tap into the emotional spectrum. But it's easier said than done. It really just requires somebody to be so angry that it basically encompasses their heart. They become the living embodiment of rage. When that happens, it's almost like going Super Saiyan for the first time in Dragon Ball, right? Like you just kind of manifest these new powers and abilities. With, uh, with the Green Lanterns, they just suddenly pop out a power battery and they're able to tap into this emotional spectrum. Now again, what this does is it leads to Atrocitus becoming the first of the Red Lanterns. Now, the other half of this is, again, this continued fallout of Sinestro Core War. And again, we covered that. We talked about that during the Sinestro Core War proper. We said that that story was going to lay the groundwork for a lot of things that came after. And there were going to be a lot of threads coming out of that that were going to continue on. One of the things that takes place here, and really one of the, the major threads that leads directly into Blackest Night, is what it was that happened to the Anti-Monitor. The Anti-Monitor is basically the harbinger of the death of the multiverse. You know, whenever the multiverse comes comes into existence, you know, it died during Crisis on Infinite Earths, it came back during Infinite Crisis. Whenever the multiverse exists, the Anti-Monitor will always manifest with it, because the Anti-Monitor is just the living embodiment of the death of the multiverse, is the best way to describe it. The result of this is that the Anti-Monitor allied itself with the Sinestro Corps. Now, at the end of Sinestro Corps War, the Anti-Monitor was more or less defeated and just kind of shot out into space. But what we ended up finding out is that some unknown being had basically grabbed Anti-Monitor and turned him into a central 
power battery. What this also does is it brings into sharp relief the idea of the Scarred Guardian. Now, I don't think the Scarred Guardian actually has a name. All we really know is that this is one of the Guardians of the Universe that has basically grabbed one of the Green Lanterns by the name of Ash and sent him on a mission of finding out what happened to the Anti-Monitor. Now, this is inevitably going to pave the way for the introduction of Blackest Night, but at this point, information is just scant. I mean, it's, it's so scarce. We'll get a little bit more into what the prophecy of the Blackest Night means as we get through this, but what ends up happening here is the Green Lanterns, Hal Jordan, Guy Gardner, John Stewart, they're tasked with basically escorting Thal Sinestro to his execution. Green Lanterns don't necessarily execute one of their own if they like abuse their power. But with Thal Sinestro, it's a whole different beast because not only did he abuse his power and find himself booted out of the Green Lantern Corps, he in turn formed his own Lantern Corps and then tried to kill Green Lanterns. And so he's basically considered guilty of high treason against the Guardians of the Universe and the Lanterns. And so because of this, what ends up happening is that in the midst of him basically being taken to his imminent execution, the most logical scenario unfolds when we end up having the Sinestro Corps really just kind of pop out of nowhere for the purpose of attacking the Green Lanterns. Now, again, all this seems to be the workings of the Scarred Guardian behind the scene. The Scarred Guardian was the one who informed the various members of the Sinestro Corps, the ones who were left, that Thal Sinestro is being escorted to his destination to Kruger. The Scarred Guardian is the one that basically passed all this information on so that the Sinestro Corps would know exactly where to hit him. But the caveat to this is that in the midst of the Green Lanterns escorting Thal Sinestro and being ambushed by the Sinestro Corps, they're met with the unexpected arrival of the Red Lanterns. Now again, the reason why Atrocitus is really chasing after Sinestro, the reason why he harbors such hatred for him is because of the fact that during the Secret Origin story that we had talked about, the one that you'll find down in the description alongside all the other Green Lantern videos in the playlist, Thal Sinestro was the guy who basically defeated Atrocitus back when Atrocitus had really just kind of popped up for one of the first times. The result was that once Atrocitus was taken back and dropped on the planet of Ismal, he basically made a prophecy that a time would come when Thal Sinestro's home planet of Karuger would descend into chaos and madness, and in an attempt to control it, Thal Sinestro would basically become a dictator. He would effectively cast aside the role of the Green Lantern and essentially become a villain. And that's exactly what happened. Now, remember, the reason why this happens is because the five inversions, who were the five survivors of the assault on Sector 666 by the Manhunters alongside Atrocitus, they had the ability to cast spells, to, del to delve into sorcery, different things like that, that would let them see the future. And so what ended up happening is when the five inversions looked into the future, they saw what Sinestro would become, the events that would lead him to this very moment. Now, Thal Sinestro initially avoided it and just said, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not worried about that. But ultimately, it all proved itself to be true. The crazy thing thing about this is that when it comes to the various lanterns and how they interact with one another, different lanterns have different effects on other lantern cores. For example, what we end up having here is the red lanterns who basically just begin burning away the power of every single lantern that they come across. The green lantern ring of Hal Jordan begins to become corrupted. And what happens is he's suddenly met by the arrival of a guy he's never seen before named Saint Walker, who claims to be a blue lantern. Now, here's a crazy thing. I do not understand why it is that, that Green Lantern fans love Saint Walker. The closest thing I can get to it, the only explanation I can come up with is the Blue Lanterns are basically like the Jedi of the DC universe. That's really it. They're just kind of like monks and they're like, all will be well. I mean, it's one of those, <laughs> it's one of those weird things. But this is what I'm talking about when I say rings can complement others. The Blue Lantern rings have the ability to basically recharge Green Lantern rings and even supercharge them. And so again, having a Blue Lantern in your corner basically bolsters the powers of a Green Lantern. Now, there are also other aspects of the Blue Lanterns, but in terms of where they come from, in terms of how they got here, what we know is that in the aftermath of the Sinestro Core War, we basically had this prophecy of Blackest Night. Now, the prophecy of Blackest Night, again, was another vision from the five inversions. They had looked into the future and they had seen there's going to be this massive war of light, that basically what's going to happen is that all the different Lantern Cores are going to fight one another. The entire emotional spectrum is basically going to be obliterated. All life in existence is going to vanish and it'll be nothing but Black the Blackest Night is quite literally what it sounds like. Now, the idea is that the Guardians of the Universe were warned by Abin Sur, the predecessor to Hal Jordan, the guy who crash landed on Earth, told his ring to go find a replacement, which chose Hal Jordan. That guy, Abin Sur, had been told of the prophecy of Blackest Night by Atrocitus. Abin Sur had reported his findings to the Guardians of the Universe, and they chose to ignore it.
What ended up happening in the significance of the Sinestro Corps War is it brought into sharp relief other Lantern Corps are starting to pop up. The Zamorons, the women, or I guess the, the different aspects of the Guardians of the Universe who used to be Malthusians or women or whatever, who broke off and began tapping into the love aspect of the emotional spectrum, they have their own core. Now we have the Red Lanterns. We have the Sinestro Corps. All we're missing now are the White Lanterns, the Black Lanterns. We haven't gotten to the Orange Lanterns yet. We have all these different Lantern Corps popping up. And when the Guardians of the Universe began to realize what was going on, a majority of them ignored everything that was happening. They said, no, the prophecy of the Blackest Night is a myth. It's not going to happen. We don't need to worry about that. But a couple of them, Ganthet and Said, believed that it was true. And so because of this, Ganthet and Said basically took the steps in saying, we need to make sure that if the prophecy of Blackest Night is true, that we're prepared for it. It's better to be prepared for something that won't happen than to not be prepared for something that will happen. And so because of that, what they ended up doing is forming their own Lantern Corps, the Blue Lanterns. Now, now, in terms of how this core uh, how this core functions and how this core exists this actually comes by way of saint walker himself and what he ends up doing is taking hal jordan to a planet called odom at least i think it's called odom there how it's pronounced but what we end up finding out is that with the green lantern cores or like the red lantern core or even the sinestro core or something like that you're basically like the rings are just kind of sent out into the universe you know the rings will be made and it'll just be like okay just go out there and just find a replacement a person will just be bonded with the ring for whatever reason either they they uh, instill great fear or they have great rage in their heart or they have the ability to overcome great fear whatever the case may be and they'll just kind of take off just be sent to training and they'll become a member of that core with regards to the blue lanterns it's not that way what happens here is that they are far more strict when it comes to inducting members into their group the process takes days and weeks a person is brought before the blue lanterns and they're basically sent through this massive ritual now the reason for this is because of the fact that the blue lanterns are largely considered to be the most powerful lantern core. Now, this is before the emergence of the White Lanterns, to be honest, but with regards to the Blue Lanterns at this point in time, they're considered to be the most powerful because there's hope. Now, the Blue Lanterns, in terms of what they can do, again, can basically cleanse a person of the Red Lantern rage, and we'll get to that why, you know, we'll get to why that happens here in a second, but the idea is that the Blue Lanterns are really more of like a foundation. You know, I mean, they have abilities and so on and so forth, but the Blue Lanterns can only really use their power if they're in the presence of like a Green Lantern. So everything has checks and balances, and that's the really cool thing about this. It's one of the reasons why the Green Lantern mythos is so just kind of intriguing and interesting is because a ring is powerful against one type of ring, but not against another. You know, it complements one of the Lantern cores, but not another. There's always these different checks and balances that go into this whole thing. Now, the other half of this is that we also pick up with the idea that really Hal Jordan is designed to kind of be this harbinger for the Blue Lanterns. The intention is to make him their leader. Now, this is not readily made to Hal Jordan. Instead, what we end up doing is we end up grabbing St. Walker and the newest introduction to the Blue Lantern Corps, and they're designed to basically go after and find Sinestro. Now, the reason for this is because of the fact that Sinestro is largely considered to be one of the, the prominent members or a significant person for the coming War of Light. We don't necessarily know why, but the indication here is that of all the people who need to live, it has to be Thal Sinestro. He has to survive this whole thing. And so again, that's why this is so intriguing is because we're given these little tidbits, these little itty bitty pieces of information about characters, and we're told how important they are, but we're not explicitly told why. Now, again, the reason why this is so important and it's so cool is because for Hal Jordan's character, he's been a trainee of Thal Sinestro. He's fought alongside Thal Sinestro and he's fought against Thal Sinestro. But their lives have basically been intertwined for years and years and years and years. Not only that, it's also this idea that once they land on the actual home planet of the Red Lanterns, and once it really just begins, you know, to get into how Jordan just recollecting on these moments, the experiences the two of them had previously, the discussions they got into and all these different things, the battles they've had and the conflict they had, even if it's only for a brief moment, Thal Sinestro becomes a friend. He's an ally for a split second when he tells Hal Jordan to watch out. Now, of course, this leads to the emergence of the Red Lanterns, who, of course, promptly capture Hal Jordan. It's really this idea that they've basically captured captured who people largely consider to be the two greatest Green Lanterns in existence. Now, of course, this leads to the arrival of the Sinestro Corps. And again, that's why this is so cool is because this is Jeff Johns in DC giving us a taste. He's like, look, right now in this story, we're going to have the Blue Lanterns and the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps battling the Red Lanterns. And that's just four. Imagine if we had all seven or eight or how many cores there are. Imagine if they were 
all fighting against each other at the same time. And that's the cool thing is because in the midst of all this with chaos and pandemonium reigning supreme, Saint Walker, they all just kind of pop up on the scene and it's like, all will be well. When the ring of Hal Jordan begins to deplete, the Blue Lanterns are there to charge it. And that I think is one of the reasons why fans love the Blue Lanterns so much because the Blue Lanterns are just kind of like, man, it's cool, dude. Just, just chill, man. Chill, dude. We got this, man. Like it's just... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's calm, it's relaxation, because they are effectively monks. Now, one thing when it comes to the idea of the Red Lanterns, when a person is imbued with a Red Lantern ring, they're designed to basically be mindless. The reason for this is because with Atrocitus being the first Red Lantern, he has full control of his faculties. You'll notice he's not like any of the other Red Lanterns. Atrocitus thinks, he rationalizes, he strategizes, he's got all this history, he taunts, different things like that. The other Red Lanterns are just mindless, raging beasts because they're not designed to be tactical. They're not designed to be reasonable, to think things through. They're designed to be a force of nature. They're designed to exist. And then Atrocitus says, go attack those guys over there. And then the Red Lanterns just show up in overwhelming force, just inflicting mass pandemonium and casualties. But when it comes to Hal Jordan, because of the fact that the former Green Lantern Lyra, again, we talked about her in the last video, because of the fact that she'd basically been exiled from the Green Lanterns, she absolutely despised the members of the Sinestro Corps, had a massive amount amount of rage, wanted to kill every last one that she came across and was following that given a red lantern ring or really just kind of forced into having a red lantern ring. She is effectively killed by Sinestro. Now, the reason why this matters is because this sends Hal Jordan over the edge. The idea was that he was going to try to find a way to save Lyra. Lyra was exiled because of the fact that she basically killed a member of the Sinestro Corps who had killed the, the family of one of her teammates. That was really it. She wasn't like a villain. She wasn't trying to conquer a world. She was just angry and hurting and dealing with it the best way she she knew how. The result was that she was suddenly bonded with a Red Lantern ring. For Sinestro, he's not killing her to spare Hal Jordan's life, not by any standard of measurement. He's doing that because he knows it'll get to Hal Jordan. And because of this, Hal Jordan snaps. Where Lyra's ring takes off and says, finding a new sentient, Hal Jordan goes absolutely berserk and just loses it on Sinestro, literally beating the absolute hell out of him. And in this moment of rage and this moment of just absolute rampage, Hal Jordan is imbued with a red lantern ring. And that's the craziest thing because this is the worst case scenario really for almost anybody. I mean, I would imagine at the time this story is being written, this is the worst case. Because imagine, for example, that Atrocitus basically gave Hal Jordan the ability to be a rational thinking being. Imagine he gave him the ability to basically be a guy who could think on his own. Hal Jordan would literally crush almost every single lantern core that he came across. This is as close as we get to the return of Parallax. One other thing to keep Keep in mind when it comes to the Red Lanterns is that when a person is made a Red Lantern, there's all kinds of things that come along with it. With regards to like the Green Lanterns, for example, let's just take the traditional Green Lantern. All right, let's say that you're sitting at home one day and a Green Lantern ring just pops up in front of you and it says, you, member of the Rob Corps, of course your Rob Corps ring can overcome the Green Lantern ring, but nonetheless, <laughs> it pops up in front of you and it says, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. You're just whisked away for training, but you can turn down the ring. You can say, you know what? I don't want to be a member of the Green Lantern Corps. I'm a member of a better corps called the Rob Corps. I don't want, I don't want no Green Lantern ring. <laughs> At least I hope you guys don't abandon me for the Green Lanterns anyway. But you could turn the ring down. You could say you don't want to be a Green Lantern and the ring will simply say, okay, searching for, for a replacement sentient. With the Red Lanterns, it doesn't work that way. Put on the Green Lantern ring and you can take it off and you have different abilities and it's all tied to your willpower, your ability to overcome fear. It's pretty straightforward. When a Red Lantern ring bonds itself to you, it becomes you. You basically have your heart replaced. Your blood is replaced with plasma. If you go to take the Red Lantern ring off, you'll die because literally the source of your ability to exist goes away. It's tantamount to having your heart ripped out of your body. That's exactly the way it works. And so because of this, under any normal circumstance, a person bonded with a Red Lantern ring is going to die. The reason why this is so cool and the reason why this is so interesting is because in this moment when Hal Jordan is basically running over all these different emotions, this pain that he's feeling, this hatred that he's feeling, this rage, all the things that Sinestro's done, where his mind and his body are going through all these physical changes in response to being given or basically
basically being possessed by a red lantern ring. Suddenly, St. Walker and company simply show up and say, we have no idea what's going to happen when we do this, but we're making you a member of the Blue Lantern Corps. And the reason why is because, again, as part of these checks and balances, the strengths of Lantern Corps versus the weaknesses of other Lantern Corps, so on and so forth, the Blue Lantern Ring basically begins the process of cleansing the person who's infected with a Red Lantern Ring. So it basically is their way out, is their caveat. Now that makes sense because if that didn't exist, what we would basically have is the Red Lanterns just spreading across the universe like a plague with no way to stop them. Now the idea here is that with Hal Jordan basically being given this Blue Lantern Ring that works in conjunction with his Green Lantern Ring, he's effectively a hybrid now. It's almost like he has the best of both worlds, which is kind of cool here because this sets the groundwork for a lot of the things that we'll end up seeing coming up next. But in terms of getting into this prelude of the whole, you know, Blackest Night, this whole scenario, we basically end up having Thal Sinestro escaping back to his home planet, you know, getting to the antimatter universe on the planet of Kord, recharging his ring using the central power battery, going out, grabbing those individuals who were truly faithful to the Sinestro Corps, killing those individuals who were not. Again, this follows a multitude of groups as we all end up getting into this idea of the War of Light. But one of the things that happens here, and one of the things that's interesting, is we also end up hinting at the Orange Light of Avarice. Now, the Orange Light of Avarice has not been discussed yet. We haven't really done anything about it yet. That'll be the next video that we do. But the Orange Light of Avarice is basically the Orange Light of Greed, and it belongs to a singular guy named Larflees. Now, in terms of why he lives in the Vega system, in terms of why it is the Guardians of the Universe have always been hands-off, we'll get into that as we get into his own individual story. But in terms of like the Star Sapphires, for example, Carol Ferris, the girlfriend of Hal Jordan joining the Star Sapphires, this comes by way of the fact that with Hal Jordan basically taking off from Earth, with Carol Ferris having continually rebuked him, she now has a change of heart. She wants him back. She wants him there. And because of that, when Hal Jordan is basically off in space and Carol Ferris takes off to clear her mind, her emotions begin to get the better of her. She begins to feel sadness. She begins to feel a loss of love. Because of this, this makes her a target target for the Star Sapphires. And so like she was originally, you know, at least way back in the 1950s when she was a Star Sapphire, this is history repeating itself all over again. And so again, that's the basis behind this Rage of the Red Lantern story. Yes, it deals with the Red Lanterns, but it's also this coming together of all these different Lantern Corps, because this is the last piece of the puzzle until we get to Blackest Night. Okay, so it is 12.30 in the morning right now, and I have recorded something like seven or eight audio files. I am exhausted. <laughs> Spent all day today doing nothing but reading comics, and uh, man, I need to get some rest. But PAX West is coming up this weekend, so I gotta prep ahead of time. So, we are finally jumping into Blackest Night, and it is about time. <laughs> I told you guys, the lead up to Blackest Night is huge. It's massive in scope. I mean, it's just, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling, because everything we've covered really with the beginning of uh, Green Lantern Secret Origin all the way up to this point has all led to Blackest Night. So it's actually really, really exciting. But one thing I want you guys to keep in mind is that this comes as part of the aftermath of the death of Batman. Now, the way this all plays out and really the, the nature of Blackest Night is to kind of hit home at the idea of character resurrections. For those of you guys who are new to comic books, character resurrections were never really a thing until the death of Superman. And the reason why was because for the most part, when a character was killed off, they usually just stayed dead. There was really no sense in bringing them back. And it was really important for writers to follow that trend because whenever they wrote stories where a character died, there was a finality to it. It was the idea that, well, this character is dead now and they're never going to come back. The death of Superman and then the return of Superman basically cheapened it. It created the standard where it essentially said, so long as there's some kind of caveat, whether it's time travel, whether it's going into a you know, healing, healing matrix, whatever it is, as long as a writer creates some sort of caveat, any character can come back. So Colossus, for example, sacrificed his life and order to cure the legacy virus, this virus that was just sweeping through the entirety of the mutant and even human community like a plague. And then following that, he was basically resurrected, you know, by, by Joss Whedon. So this whole idea that the characters don't really stay dead anymore all really has its roots in the death of Superman. With Batman, he essentially died during Final Crisis. Now, of course, we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through this video, but the idea here
here is that we initially pick up with the Scarred Guardian. Now, we don't really know who the Scarred Guardian is. We just know that it's this Guardian whose face is scarred. Now, the reason for this is because this is one of the Guardians that faced off against the Anti-Monitor during the events of Sinestro Core War. Now, keep in mind, the Anti-Monitor basically channels antimatter energy, whereas everything in the main DC universe is positive energy. In this story, it's just the idea that if positive matter is touched by antimatter, it'll begin to erode. And so that's why the Guardian's face is so scarred and so screwed up, is because it was basically touched by the Anti-Monitor, which began to erode its face away. Now, the response to this was that as this Guardian was essentially on the brink of death, it was suddenly met by the entity Necron, one of the many entities that exist as part of the emotional spectrum. Keep in mind, within the DC universe, you have the emotional spectrum, and the emotional spectrum is just a reflection of sentient life. And so as long as there are beings out there, alien, human, otherwise, who feel anger, who feel love, who feel compassion, whatever the case may be, that part of the emotional spectrum will exist because of the fact that it's fed by those very emotions. Likewise, because there are beings that exist, a time will come come when they die. And so the Black Lantern Corps represents the concept of death. The idea is that while this Guardian was basically experiencing what amounted to near-death experience, so to speak, it was met with Necron because each of these different parts of the emotional spectrum basically has a kind of entity that represents it, which is to say all the emotion in the universe, you know, all the fear, for example, in the universe coalesces into a being that embodies all the fear that exists in the universe. Of course, that being coming in the form of parallax. These are how all these different things work. In the case of the Black Lanterns, the concept of death coalesces into a being called Necron, meaning that Necron seems to be basically undefeatable. So long as there's life in existence, Necron will never die just because of the fact that, you know, Necron represents the concept of something dying. Again, it gets really kind of crazy and really sort of mind boggling when we get to these levels of thinking. But the cool thing is about this is about as complicated as it gets. So the funny thing about this is that this Guardian basically gives us this sort of rundown of the really the history of the universe when it comes to these various lands lanterns, as well as, you know, the, the manhunters that exist. So in order to follow this trend, it's pretty self-explanatory, but in order to follow this trend, uh, what we know is that in the beginning, there was just the creation of the universe, however the universe came into existence. Following this, there was the very first race in existence called the Maltusians. And the Maltusians had basically evolved and grown to the point where they basically came to realize that emotion was the source of all problems in the universe. A person is struggling financially, they get angry, and in their anger, they get envious. In their envy, they take what somebody else has. This is basically the, the root of all evil, emotion itself. That's how the guardians of the universe viewed it. And so the Maltusians began the process of basically casting off emotion. Now, DC Rebirth comes back and ties into a lot of that stuff with Volthoom, providing a lot of information we didn't have before. And we'll cover all that once we get around to like Wrath of the First Lantern and different things like that. But the long and short of it for this video right now is that the Maltusians had basically cast out emotion and then began the process of creating this sort of universal police force, which came in the form of these android manhunters. Now, the problem with this is that these android manhunters eventually went awry. Now, this all ties into, the, into something called Krona's Gauntlet, which is to say a very primitive version of the Green Lantern rings, basically. And what we know is that Krona was one of the Maltusians, one of the guardians of the universe, who wanted to see the beginning of all things. And so the result was that when he did this, he effectively created all evil. He basically came, you know, more or less went back in time and created the anti-monitor leading to the collapse of the multiverse and all that kind of crazy stuff. But the idea here is that with Krona being a bad guy, Krona actually messed with the programming of the uh, of the Manhunters, which in turn sent them on this murderous crusade. That's where the Red Lanterns come from and all those things. But in response to the Manhunters going awry, becoming evil, uh, the Guardians of the Universe came to the realization that if sentient beings are what basically power the emotional spectrum, then the best way to tap into the emotional spectrum is to use sentient beings. But in order to do that, they can't just give them all kinds of crazy power. There have to be these sort of standards, these checks and balances that ensure that if a person is given a ring that allows them to channel directly into the emotion of willpower, that they won't use it for evil deeds. Now, of course, we know that Sinestro ended up doing that, but the idea was that the Guardians of the Universe created the Green Lantern rings and then had them go out and seek people who were deemed to be worthy hosts. Thus was born the Green Lantern Corps. The issue with this is that along the way, the Green Lanterns had basically encountered Atrocitus, the first of the Red Lanterns. And Atrocitus, by, you know, looking into the future, by casting different prophecies, had basically learned of something called the Prophecy of Blackest Night. This idea that all these Lantern Corps would rise, all these Lantern Corps would go to war, some unknown dark force would come into existence, and then basically wipe out all emotion in the universe, and then wipe everything out, and all life would basically cease to exist. Because of the fact that this basically created a scenario where the Guardians of 
of the universe had to face the idea that their lives, their existence were not under their control, they in turn chose to ignore it. Now, where a couple of the Guardians, Ganthet and Sade, where they were basically banished from the Guardians of the Universe for refusing to ignore the prophecy of Blackest Night, one of them, the Scarred Guardian, actually began the process of ensuring the Blackest Night came into existence. And so that's where a lot of this stuff ends up happening. It's basically gathering all these different things together, these different resources, pushing the Guardians, operating behind the scenes, moving them in the direction of ensuring that this War of the Lantern Corps, this War of Light, begins to take place. And so what our story does is it actually transitions over to a guy named William Hand. Now, this is one of the reasons why it is that I said that with the whole Jeff Johns run on Green Lantern, that he would just kind of introduce a character and this character would pop up in a little bit of a story over here and then they'd never be seen or heard from again for like a year and a half. This is one of those instances. William Hand was a guy who popped up in the secret origin of Hal Jordan. And all we knew about him at the time was that he was just obsessed with the concept of death. Now, the idea was that with the secret origin of Hal Jordan designed to go back and retell Hal Jordan the Green Lantern's origin story from the time he first appeared in DC Comics all the way up to the modern day, we ended up finding out that William Hand was there when Hal Jordan first became the Green Lantern. He's simply been operating behind the scenes the entire time. The question became, what is this harbinger of the Black Lantern Corps? What was he doing during this time? And that's why this is so cool, this tale of the Black Lantern, because it's basically the life and times of the first Black Lantern, the person who would basically usher in this core that would try to eliminate all things in existence. Now, what we know about William Hand is, again, referencing this you know, little bit of history with his character, he was obsessed with death. What this tells us is how obsessed with death he was. It wasn't like one day he just said, you know what, I think death is cool. Instead, it was a gradual thing. It was him dealing with his family who were essentially morticians, or at least his father who was a mortician, watching the things that he did and becoming enamored by the idea of death. In the same way that people will fire up a video game and say, this is the greatest video game I've ever played and I'm gonna play it all the time because it's the absolute best, William Hand loved death the exact same way. He was enamored by it, he studied it, he always wanted to be surrounded by it. He was uncomfortable with living normal humans human beings. Instead, he was more comfortable when he was surrounded by the dead. The result of this is that back when Atrocitus, you know, the, the harbinger of the Red Lantern Corps, first popped up on Earth, again, Atrocitus had looked to the future and seen that a guy named William Hand was going to bring about this Blackest Night, this War of Light. And so the result is that Atrocitus sought to eliminate William Hand. This led to the intervention of both Sinestro and Hal Jordan, the newest introduction to the Green Lantern Corps, working together and then taking Atrocitus out. Following this, William Hand just remained behind the scenes for the most part. The weapon of Atrocitus, this, you know, uh, device that was able to channel Green, Lan uh, Green Lantern energy, was essentially left behind. And in using this, what ended up happening is William Hand just sort of became this guy that was going through the process of trying to implement death everywhere he went. He's simply just obsessed with the concept of killing things. Now, of course, this leads to him donning his costume, basically becoming Black Hand. This, of course, references all the way back to the old school Green Lantern stories, where Black Hand was very much a minor villain of Hal Jordan. This expands on that, and it basically says, this is the road that William Hand took that led him to basically becoming the harbinger of the Black Lantern Corps. Now, the other half of this is that because William Hand was operating behind the scenes the entire time that Hal Jordan was the Green Lantern, he was privy to all these different changes. So when Jon Stewart first popped up as the second Green Lantern on Earth, followed by Guy Gardner, followed by Kyle Rayner, the events of Emerald Twilight, when he basically began to change channel, all this fear became a host for the living embodiment of fear in the form of Parallax, wiped out all the Green Lanterns. These are all the things that William Hand was seeing. He was watching them happen. The idea here was that he had seen more and more superheroes die more and more often. The issue with this is that each time, for the most part, they kept coming back. So characters like Digger Harkness, Ted Kord, Maxwell Lord himself, who was killed by Wonder Woman in response for shooting Ted Kord. You know, all these different things that existed out there. The death of John Jones, Aquaman, or at least the perceived death of Aquaman. You know, all these different things have gone into the idea that as far as William Hand is concerned, what is dead should stay dead. In his mind, death is really a living entity. People who die should not be allowed to return. And in his mind, with Superman having quote unquote,
unquote died only to basically be healed with Hal Jordan quote unquote dying only to come back after being taken by the Spectre with Kilowog with Bart Allen with Barry Allen dying and then coming back to life during Final Crisis again these are all the ideas that William Hand believes that death has been cheated and so because of this his goal is to basically find a way to begin the process of giving death the people it rightfully deserves this coincides with his desire to just inflict as much death as he possibly can to kill anything he can where he can and some of the first victims are basically his family he goes through and begins killing each member of his family ultimately turning this device on himself now the reason why this matters is because when this happens uh, it's basically him fully handing himself over to Necron the entity of death and that's really the way it works with these different lantern cores right I mean you know for example if we take the red lanterns it was really Atrocitus just experiencing absolute rage over the fact that his family had been obliterated by the Manhunters. The result was that as he began to channel this rage, as he looked into the future and saw he was going to be the harbinger of the Red Lantern Corps, he fulfilled that prophecy by creating the Red Lantern Corps, by forcing the creation of a Red Lantern uh, power battery and then a Red Lantern central power battery. It was just working through the emotion of rage. Every single core always has that one person that creates it. And that person goes through all these different steps and all these different processes, this journey of sorts that ultimately leads to the formation of that core. With William Hand, it's a little bit different. It's not like the Scarred Guardian shows up, basically spews this Black Lantern ring out, which in turn attaches itself to William Hand and says, you are going to be my harbinger for the Black Lantern Corps. And it's not like the Scarred Guardian started spitting out all these Black Lantern rings and they all just started going around because then the question is, who would they go to? This is basically the core of death. And so the only thing that really can be done here is for William Hand to begin the process of resurrecting the dead. And that's why this is so cool is because at this point, we switch over to the perspective of the death of Batman through the eyes of Barry Allen the Flash and Hal Jordan himself. Now this is told from a variety of different ways, but when it came to the death of Batman, it's really more of a misnomer. Batman being hit by the Omega Beams of, uh, of Darkseid during Final Crisis was basically this idea that, they, that DC could essentially remove Batman from the landscape for a time and then tell a story of his eventual return. What ended up happening is Batman was just time displaced. That's all it was. He was thrown back to the very early days of humanity and that was really it. Now, of course, this was DC's attempt to basically set the stage to go back and retell this grandiose story for the origin of Batman. In the end, it didn't matter because they rebooted like two years later. But the whole idea here is that from the perspective of Hal Jordan and Barry Allen, they don't know that Batman's all the way back at the early days of humanity. As far as they're aware, Batman is dead. Now, the other half of this is that Hal Jordan begins talking about the idea of how people respond to those individuals who have been killed. Keep in mind, when Barry Allen died, he died as a hero. He died basically saving the multiverse, you know? And so there were all these different responses to his death, all these different ideas that people were coming back. People were saying, oh man, we have to celebrate the life and times of Barry Allen. For Hal Jordan, it wasn't that way. I mean, you know, we talked about this a little bit ago. Hal Jordan's life has been mired in just controversy and struggle and strife. But as Parallax, he didn't die a hero. Nobody looked at Hal Jordan and said, oh man, and that's so sad. This once great Green Lantern had a fall from grace, but we should remember him the way he used to be. Not at all. People looked at him and said, he's a bad guy. He is a villain. He died a coward's death. He went out like a madman. And that is the legacy that's been haunting Hal Jordan ever since. Remember, with the whole run of, of Jeff John's Green Lantern, when he originally started killing all those original Green Lanterns, of course, we ended up finding out that some survived, the Lost Lanterns, as they're referred to. But the idea is they look at him and say, you betrayed us. You tried to kill us. Batman himself, you know, despite the fact that Batman and Hal Jordan were extremely close friends, when Hal Jordan became a villain and started calling himself Parallax, he betrayed the trust of Batman. And that was a trust that was broken that took time to reform. And so again, this is the whole, you know, legacy that he's dealing with. This is the aftermath of the events that he's coping with. At the same time, Batman was only one of the more recent deaths in comic books. William Hand's goal is to essentially begin resurrecting all these guys, make them his lantern core in an effort to start killing off all these different beings that exist all throughout the universe itself. So again, this leads into a massive calamity, which ultimately goes into brightest day and it goes into you know the whole like white lanterns and all kinds of cool stuff and this is when we start getting into the cool stories 
Oh my God, Rob Core, man. Let me, man, let me tell y'all something. This story, dude, Blackest Night, man, this story is so good. If God was writing Green Lantern right now, this is what it would look like right now. This is one of the best stories that I've ever seen, ever read in the history of comic books. Dude, this story is so amazing. So Blackest Night is as much like a soft reboot as it is just like this amazing epic. Because remember, Blackest Night basically focuses on the resurrection of like all these dead superheroes. Kind of a resurrection. It's sort of a weird situation. But Blackest Night really is like this next stage of Jeff John's run on Green Lantern. And this has been a long time coming. Keep in mind, the Green Lantern, I guess, landscape as it's progressed over the course of the entire, you know, series that we've done so far, which we cover every Sunday, the idea is that it all started with like Sinestro Core War, right? Like Thal Sinestro, formerly a Green Lantern, abused his powers, he was banished, he found a Yellow Lantern, or he basically had a Yellow Lantern ring created for himself, and then formed his own core. This led as a direct conflict between the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Core. But the idea yeah, was that this was really rooted in the character of Avin Sur. Avin Sur was a Green Lantern. He was the one who died on Earth and gave his ring to Hal Jordan. But Avin Sur had been told of the prophecy of Blackest Night by a being named Atrocitus. Atrocitus had looked into the future and saw that there was going to be this massive war of light and the Black Lanterns would rise and extinguish all life across the universe. But the Guardians of the Universe saw this as fear-mongering. Atrocitus was the guy who made the Red Lantern Corps. And so the idea was that because Green Lanterns have to overcome fear, in order to be able to use their powers, that this was all just a tactic used by Atrocitus for the purpose of weakening Avensur so he could be defeated. Because of this, almost none of the Guardians took it seriously. The only two who did were Ganthet and Sade. And in order to protect themselves from the prophecy of Blackest Night and to ensure that there would be some sort of way to win, they formed the Blue Lantern Corps. And so at that point, it was just a waiting game. We had the Blue Lanterns there, we had the Indigo Tribe, this super mysterious Lantern Corps that we didn't really know anything about. You had the Star Sapphires who were a uh, Lantern core rooted in love. You had the Green Lanterns, you had the Sinestro core that was kind of out there somewhere, and then you had the Red Lanterns, and that was really about it. I mean, it was just, okay, now we're just having these stories and we're just waiting until Blackest Night happens. But all of this really stems from a guy named William Hand. This guy is a dude who was just obsessed with death. But because all the different lanterns, uh, lantern cores that exist out there have entities, basically these living embodiments of their respective emotions, the living embodiment of death is a being named Necron. And this is the person that William Hand basically worships. But the idea here is that this all initially kicks off with William Hand literally going to the grave of Bruce Wayne and taking his skull. Now, this comes immediately out of Final Crisis, and we have not covered Final Crisis just because of the fact that that story is an exercise in the absolute befuddlement and mind-boggling of why a person would write a story like that. But the long and short of Bruce Wayne's involvement in Final Crisis is that the villain Darkseid, one of the new gods, had basically sought to dominate all things in existence by using the anti-life equation. At the end of the story, Bruce Wayne fired a killing shot at Darkseid. Darkseid used his Omega Sanctions, which should have just killed Bruce Wayne. Instead, he was actually time displaced, which is one of the roles this story serves to basically show us that Bruce Wayne's not dead, but everyone believes he's dead. And so because of this, of course, he's been buried at Wayne Manor, so on and so forth. And the idea is that in the face of Bruce Wayne being believed to have been dead, we end up having all these Black Lantern rings which are just sent out across the entire universe. Now, what this does is this switches over to Coast City. And this is kind of a cool thing because again, all this really goes back to like Hal Jordan becoming Parallax. For those of you guys who are new to the whole Green Lantern landscape, Coast City plays a really significant role, not just because of its location, but because of the place that it has within the realm of the superhero community. Coast City is the basically the main base of operations, the main city for Hal Jordan. It's really like his home, more or less. And the idea was that back in the 1990s, DC wanted to get rid of Hal Jordan. They wanted to remove him from the equation and replace him with a new Green Lantern. So what DC did is they wrote a story called Emerald Twilight. And Emerald Twilight came out of the death of Superman. We had Superman dying at the hands of Doomsday. We had four new Supermen who popped up on the scene. One of these was a guy named Cyborg. And the idea was that Cyborg Superman, alongside a villain named Mongol, attacked Coast City and destroyed it. The result was that when Hal Jordan came back from a mission in space, he found everything he knew and loved completely obliterated. What this did is it left him open to exposure to fear. Basically, he lost his ability to overcome fear for a temporary amount of time. But in that small window, it allowed the living embodiment of fear named Parallax to enter Hal Jordan. Now, the idea of, of Parallax entering Hal Jordan and possessing him, that was a Jeff Johns change. That was not something that we learned until like 2006, 2007. But the idea was that at the time, it was basically Hal Jordan just becoming a bad guy. And so what ended up happening here is Hal Jordan basically just 
just laid waste to the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps. It was a massacre like nothing we'd ever seen before. He ended up destroying all the Green Lanterns. He killed all the Guardians of the Universe except for one. And so what ended up happening is that with Hal Jordan basically mainlining the willpower emotion and mainlining fear, he basically became God, just started calling himself Parallax. Now what this did is it led to the last remaining Guardian of the Universe, Ganthet, traveling to Earth and giving Kyle Rayner a ring. And that's where Kyle Rayner ended up becoming the Green Lantern. That's how his whole origin story comes into play. But the idea here is that because Coast City was being rebuilt as part of Jeff John's run on the Green Lantern stories, what this does is it brings us to its conclusion, which is to say Coast City has been fixed now. Coast City has been repaired. People are starting to move back. It's this whole revelation that Coast City is the place to be now. And it's a celebration of a multitude of different things. This also comes on the holiday that's basically been created as a result of Superman's death. When Superman died at the hands of Doomsday back in the 1990s, the superheroes of the DC universe basically christened that as a holiday. When he came back, it was the day of Superman's death, the day of Superman's return, so on and so forth. And so that became like this national event. But what ends up happening is we get this sort of rundown about all these different instances of people who have died, people who have loved others, who have lost the ones they loved. It's really kind of this day to remember all the most important things in life, but to also honor those individuals who have died. And so again, this touching on these various characters, these various individuals who have played roles in the realm of the superhero community. One of the more notable instances is Aquaman Arthur Curry. Following the event of Infinite Crisis, basically the story that brought the multiverse back after Crisis on Infinite Earths, DC had a series of comics called 52, but they also had something called The Missing Year. And the idea was that after Infinite Crisis, Aquaman was gone. Nobody knew where he was. Now, the intention of DC at the time was to actually kill him, was to have him dead and gone forever. But Aquaman, uh, despite the legacy of being the guy that quote unquote talks to fish, fans still loved him and fans wanted him to return. So we ended up making his debut. What this ends up doing is it still leaves out there the idea that Aquaman is dead. Not only that, it actually solidifies the belief that Aquaman's dead in the sense that with Mira and with Garth, basically, you know, Aqualad more or less talking about the, the death of Aquaman and overlooking his grave and so on and so forth, he actually ends up re-emerging. He's one of the one of these other people who pops up during the whole event of Blackest Night, which is to say a person who has a Black Lantern ring. Now, he's not the first person we see. I just kind of throw it in there because we were talking about Aquaman anyway. What we actually end up doing is picking up with Barry Allen. Again, one of the big revelations that came during Final Crisis is that where Barry Allen was believed to have died during Crisis on Infinite Earths, and it only ever really popped up once in a while in terms of like a flashback or something along those lines, what Final Crisis revealed and what Flash Rebirth, the original Flash Rebirth revealed, was that Barry Allen never died. Barry Allen merged with the Speed Force, and in the 20 some odd years, or even longer than that, the 25 years that, it, that he had basically been missing from DC Comics, in truth, he'd actually been in the Speed Force outrunning death constantly. And so because of that, during Final Crisis, Barry Allen re-emerged. And it was one of the coolest moments ever because it's like Jay Garrick and I think Wally West and like one other person they're there, you know, and like a portal opens up and it's just like, Jay, Wally, run! And like Barry Allen comes running out of this portal. And like, I remember reading, and it was like, holy cow! <laughs> It was hilarious because if you go and look at message boards back in 2009, people were just like, what? People were freaking out because Barry Allen returned and it was one of the crazy things. But the other half of this is that with Barry Allen being alive, one thing to keep in mind is that his return basically comes after 25 years of being absent. And so literally how Jordan catches him up on everyone who's died over the last 25 years, whether it was a day ago or it was 25 years ago. And this includes a lot of people. It includes John Jones, Martian Manhunter, Black Canary, Dove, Aquaman, and includes all these characters Barry had fought alongside during his years when he was a superhero. And so learning all of this, what we also end up finding out is that the Justice League is not without honor. The Justice League actually ended up taking the corpses of people whose identities as villains were known and basically keeping them in the Hall of Justice, giving them an honorable burial. Now, the other half of this really deals with what's going on out in space, which is to say the War of Light. Remember, while all this is taking place on Earth, all the other Lantern Corps are out fighting. Basically, all of the Green Lanterns that exist out there, with the exception of like Hal Jordan on Earth, they're all out in space. They're all fighting against the Xamarons, the Star Sapphires, the Sinestro Corps. I mean, they're basically engaged in this massive war of light. And that's what the Guardians begin to comment on. None of these guys believed it was real. None of these guys believed that the war of light was going to happen. None of them believed the Blackest Night prophecy was actually going to come to fruition. But faced with this war of light, faced with the Green Lanterns fighting the Red Lanterns, fighting the Blue Lanterns, fighting the Indigos, fighting the
fighting the Star Sapphires, fighting the Sinestro Corps, faced with all of that, the Guardians of the Universe now have to come to accept the fact that the War of Light is happening. The problem with this is that it's preparing for an earthquake after the earthquake's already started. It's too late. And so at this point, they're literally just under damage control. But what little hope they have in trying to stave off this War of Light, or at the very least, trying to come out on the winning side, is almost completely swept away when the Scarred Guardian reveals her allegiance to the Black Lanterns. Remember, after the events of Sinestro Corps War, there were these small things that happened here and there in the Green Lantern story that all led into this, all led into this Blackest Night run. This is essentially the first strike. In this instance, one of the Guardians is killed by the Scarred Guardian, the rest are imprisoned, and the shield around Oa is brought down. And what this does is it allows these Black Lantern rings to just start flying and just begin bonding themselves to all these dead Green Lanterns and resurrecting them. If you guys haven't grasped it by now, all hell is breaking loose. <laughs> This is crazy. Katie bar the door. The it's man, man. This is why I say this story is so good. <laughs> man, Jeff Johns, why do you have to write such damn good stories? All like things are just popping off. And that's what people are basically coming to coming to realize here. Kyle Rayner, Kilowog, Guy Gardner, these guys who are like, you know, members of the Green Lantern Corps out there in space, Barry Allen, H uh, Hal Jordan, they're coming to the realization that all these dead superheroes are coming back as Black Lanterns. And that's what's so cool about this. Because what ends up happening is we basically have all this pandemonium taking place. Now, another thing to keep in mind are the characters of Elongated Man and Sue Dibney. Sue Dibney's character really gained like her biggest moment in DC Comics when she was killed by Gene Loring during the events of Identity Crisis. Now that's a story that we haven't covered yet just because it's so controversial. It's a pretty dark story. It's it's pretty, pretty crazy, but it basically deals with like mind wiping, different things like that. But the idea here is that Elongated Man essentially died during Countdown to Final Crisis, I think it was. And so they've been gone for quite some time, Sue Dibney having already been killed. And so this is basically bringing those characters back for kind of a short stint. Now, they have like pretty significant roles in the hearts and minds of a lot of DC fans everywhere. A lot of DC fans are just like, yeah, man, Ralph Dibney. I don't know what he did outside of Identity Crisis, but I remember that. <laughs> I remember Sue Dibney during Identity Crisis, but I don't know anything about her outside of that, which is fine because a lot of people latch on to characters during particular stories. The idea here is that this is essentially different people trying to deal with the emergence of these Black Lanterns all at the same time. Now with Aquaman, with him popping up, as a Black Lantern, this basically goes into him killing off a multitude of his soldiers, attempting to take Mira as his queen, and then using his powers to literally just kill almost everybody else around him. Now, of course, this also introduces the death of Garth, but again, this is when we start getting into this whole soft reboot thing. The reason for this is because of the fact that with like Elongated Man and Sue Dibney, for example, they end up showing up and they kill Hawkman and they kill Hawkwoman, and then they basically turn him into Black Lanterns. But the idea was for DC to essentially kill off all these different characters and then say, okay, with all these characters, quote unquote, being dead, here's the ones that we're going to bring back. And so it was essentially kind of a soft reboot. You know, it was better than simply having like Hawkman walk down the road and get shot in the face. And they're like the death of Hawkman. Like it was a lot more interesting than that. So it kept things interesting. It kept them going smoothly, but it also allowed DC to get rid of characters that either weren't popular or their stories weren't selling or what have you. But one of the other things that we end up learning is that these characters who were dead and are being quote unquote resurrected are not their real cells. And that actually comes from a guy named Boston Brand. Now, Dead Man is a guy who basically just goes around inhabiting bodies. He just takes over people. He's part of that whole DC vertigo, uh, mysticism, magic. He's part of all that, that storyline that goes over there. But the reason why this matters is because Dead Man actually shows up as a Black Lantern while simultaneously existing as his normal self. And so what this means is that these Black Lanterns that are running around as superheroes are not actually resurrected superheroes. Instead, they're basically duplicates. But the reason why this matters and the reason why them showing up the way they do is pause for concern is because in order for them to basically begin rising, in order for them to essentially charge the central power battery to 100%, they need people who are in various emotional states and then they need to consume their hearts. And so what this does is with them emerging with these various superheroes faced with teammates, friends, former lovers who are believed to have been resurrected from the dead as evil 
lanterns, then suddenly it starts putting them in this emotional state of fear or rage or something along those lines. And because they're so charged with emotional energy, they take their hearts, they consume them, and the entire Black Lantern Corps is even more empowered because of it. Now, one of the biggest moments of the Black Lantern Corps comes in the form of the Spectre. Remember, the Spectre is basically the representation of God's vengeance. But the Spectre is one of these characters in DC Comics who's about as close as we get to DC's iteration of like the cosmic entities. You remember, Marvel deals with things like the representation of the universe, how long it takes from the time the universe was made to the time that it ends, that time span. They have like cosmic entities for that. They have cosmic entities that represent the entirety of the universe. They have cosmic entities that represent all these different things. DC plays it a little more realistic. DC plays it as, okay, so there's the presence. There's basically God in the DC universe. Then there's like Lucifer Morningstar, basically Satan. But the reason why this matters is because these characters, these higher pantheon of characters in DC are largely considered to be so astronomically powerful that they're well beyond the capabilities of any traditional superhero. But then in the face of these, these Black Lanterns emerging, these rings bonding themselves to people, one of the rings takes over and corrupts the specter. And so what this means is that the power of the Black Lantern rings is basically of the highest echelon, of the highest order, that no one can withstand the power of these rings. The reason why this matters is because this is Jeff Johns basically saying, no one's safe. There's no safe haven. But he does provide one exception. The only exception he provides to this are individuals who died and are at peace. And so what it basically seems to indicate is that the only individuals who can be resurrected or who can basically be copied by the Black Lantern rings are individuals who died under grudging circumstances, people who died unwillingly. And so because of that, it allows them to basically be copied to reemerge and it just sends things spiraling almost out of control. Now, of course, this also brings into fray the superheroes doing the best they can. Because again, when you're faced with power like this, it's not a matter of overcoming them by traditional means. It's a matter of just running like hell and hoping you survive another day. And in this instance, this is brought to us by virtue of Barry Allen and Hal Jordan. Remember, Barry Allen is a chemist as much as he is the Flash. And it's not very often that you see those two things go hand in hand. You usually see that aspect of his personality when he's doing his normal job as a forensic investigator. But it's cool seeing him in this instance because as we know with Martian Manhunter, his biggest weakness is fire. And so it makes sense to Barry Allen to basically just start dousing him, surrounding him with chemicals. And then when Hal Jordan throws a car in and the car blows up, everything catches a flame that Martian Manhunter would be weakened. The problem with this is that that's not the case. Instead, John Jones, Martian Manhunter, emerges just like he did before. And so what this does is, again, this sets the stage by saying that the traditional weakness of superheroes as they existed before they became Black Lanterns is not really effective here. Instead, you have to defeat them as Black Lanterns as opposed to how they used to be. Now, from here, we actually end up transitioning to a guy named Jason Rush and to a girl named, I guess it's Jenny. It's spelled really weird. It's like G-E-H-N-E-E -E -E or something like that. But the idea here is that this was DC's attempt to basically reinvigorate the whole concept of Firestorm. Remember, Ronnie Raymond as Firestorm had been that way for quite some time, and it's one of the most popular iterations of his character. And this instance is actually Jason and this girl, uh, Jenny, we're gonna go ahead and call her that, who basically inhabit the same body, or at least who will become the Firestorm concept. The issue with this is that Jason had basically merged with several people before this. So it was literally DC grabbing him and saying, okay, Jason Rush will be the main Firestorm person, and then we'll grab whoever else and see which person fans liked the most. The issue was that Jenny was not really a character fans enjoyed too much, so they actually end up killing her off in this story. But again, one of the other things that we end up learning is that the, the Black Lantern rings cannot just be removed by traditional means. Instead, the rings actually grow roots down into the person. They are part and parcel. So trying to remove the ring is almost impossible because the ring will come back. That person is part of the Black Lantern Corps and they will stay that way unless a tried and true means of taking them down can actually be found. And so because of this, you know, with Jason Rush, with Jenny basically going through, investigating as best they can, of course, we end up finding out that they were summoned to the Hall of Justice by Mira herself, the wife of Aquaman. And that's really where the story begins to hit home, because what this is, is just escaping. It's them just fleeing for their lives. Now, of course, this also coincides with the arrival of the Indigo Tribe. Now, remember, the Indigo Tribe are very mysterious, but one of the reasons why the Indigo Tribe are so powerful is because they can tap into and manipulate other Lantern Corps. And so in this instance, Indigo One, the leader of the Indigo Tribe, is actually able to separate one of the Black Lanterns from their rings using a combination of the Indigo Tribe's power and the Green Lantern's power. So again, what this does is it actually tells everybody else who's there that being able to defeat the Black Lanterns basically 
it comes through combining powers together and trying to take them out. But that's a stopgap measure. All it's really going to do is solve things temporarily. What they need is a tried and true measure of bringing the Black Lanterns down. And the cool thing about this is Jeff Johns teases it to us. Jeff John actually tells us something called the white light. And what he basically says is that in the beginning of all things, there was simply just white light. There was just white. That's all there was. But eventually the darkness essentially, you know, overruled the light. It took over and it led to the creation of all life, the emotional spectrum and so on. And the white light fragmented. And so what this means is that the white lantern ring, as most people know by now, is effectively a combination of all the lantern rings, you know, brought together, or at least one of each lantern ring combined into one. And that of course will be the means by which they end up winning. I mean, I don't mind throwing that out there because this story came out like eight years ago. So most people know what's going on with regards to this. But again, you know, at this point, it's just a matter of trying to get away. It's just a matter of trying to win. Now, of course, this leads to Jenny basically being killed off. And again, fans didn't really enjoy her too much. She was mysterious. DC never really expanded on her. And so because of that, they ended up killing her character off and it leaves the landscape open for Jason to merge with someone else. And so in the face of all this, because of the fact that the Black Lanterns are continuing to rise in prominence, the question becomes, where's Superman? Where's Wonder Woman? Where are these superheroes that we're most familiar with who we would think would at the very least be here in the midst of this conflict? Well, we're not immediately told. And in fact, there's actually tie-ins for those characters, which we are going to cover. But in the face of recognizing that a combination of Green Lantern energy among other forms of energy can temporarily defeat individual members of the Black Lanterns, it then becomes basically Barry Allen running around broadcasting this information to everyone who's out there. And so this is when we find out that Wonder Woman is fighting these Black Lanterns, that all these different characters who exist out there, the Titans, the Teen Titans, that they're all facing off against these Black Lanterns doing the best they can. Not only that, it's also this revelation that individuals like Dr. Fate are Black Lanterns. Dr. Fate, of course, again, being the predecessor to Marvel's Dr. Strange. But again, these are all great moments. Power Girl, Alan Scott, the Green Lantern of Earth 2. All these characters are facing off against the best they can to hold off against unstoppable odds. And so as this section of the video begins to wind down, what ends up happening is the Black Lantern central power battery is teleported to Coast City by the Scarred Guardian. And what we end up finding out is that with the central power battery charged at 100%, what it does is it allows the living embodiment of death, the entity known as Necron, to enter into the earthly plane, to enter into the main DC universe and make his presence known while simultaneously resurrecting every single person who's ever died in Coast City and dragging them into the Black Lantern Corps. Okay, so a few things. Uh, first and foremost, I had intended to finish Green Lantern Blackest Night by the time Halloween ended. But then I was going through and I was like, well, we haven't really done anything with like the Green Lantern tie-in or the Green Lantern core. Now, the funny thing about this is that the, the Green Lantern mythos is just largely those two titles. That's really all it is. Uh, they cross over in terms of like big events like Sinestro Core War, different things like that. But usually they tell two distinctly different stories from two distinctly different perspectives. The issue I ran into is we we wouldn't be able to have the entirety of Blackest Night done by the time we finished all the tie-ins if we kept it every Sunday when Halloween rolls around. So we're doing it on our DC days. <laughs> we get three Green Lantern videos a week. I guess three Blackest Night videos a week, rather. So if you've loved Blackest Night, uh, you're going to be hyped. We're still going to keep our DC Rebirth stuff, so we're going to have to double upload, which works because like for the next couple weeks, it'll basically be Green Lantern, Blackest Night, and Dark Knight's Metal on the DC days. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you guys will be over the moon in terms of the stuff that we're going to be doing. But again, Blackest Night really comes out of the events of Sinestro Core War. That's really all this is. And that's why Sinestro Core War is so important. One of the things that we learned over the course of Jeff John's entire run of Green Lantern is that there was this prophecy called the Prophecy of Blackest Night. And the idea was that over the course of the existence of the universe, these different cores would come into existence. The Red Lanterns would come into existence and the Blue Lanterns would come into existence and the Star Sapphires and the, you know, Indigo Tribe and all that kind of stuff all these lanterns would rise to prominence most all of them would be super obscure and almost nobody would know about them save for the green lanterns themselves and then the sinestro core when they rose to power during the events of sinestro core war but the prophecy of blackest night basically stated that there would be this war of light among all the lantern cores and the result is that the black lanterns would basically rise and then eliminate all life in the universe and that's exactly what's happening the guardians of the universe some of the most powerful beings in existence knew about the prophecy of blackest night they 
believed the prophecy of Blackest Night was fear-mongering. It was an attempt to strip Green Lanterns of their power by instilling in them this belief that the universe would come to an end and all these Lantern Corps would rise. And in doing so, Green Lanterns would cease to be as powerful as they once were, paving the way for almost any number of other villains to rise to power. Now, because of that, when Sinestro Corps War popped off and in the aftermath of Sinestro Corps War, once we got into Infinite Crisis and those storylines, and once the Black Lanterns started to rise, the Guardians of the Universe kind of looked around and said, well, I guess they were right. <laughs> the problem is that this created a rift of sorts because a couple of the Guardians named Ganthet and Sade always believed the prophecy was going to come into existence. And so in order to prepare for it, they created the Blue Lantern Corps. And the Blue Lantern just kind of existed out there. The fact remains here that in the presence of all these Black Lantern rings, when we began covering Blackest Night, we basically did issues one through four and then stopped and started doing tie-ins. The reason for that is because everything that we're covering right now in terms of these tie-ins really until I say otherwise this is all taking place during the first four issues of Blackest Night. The other half of this is that almost everybody is encountering this in their own way at the outset. The Green Lantern Corps is encountering all this stuff at the outset. Hal Jordan and those guys are on Earth. They're encountering it. Jon Stewart is actually just sort of pondering the nature of the mistakes that he's made when it came to the planet of Zanchi. Now we talked about this before. Between 1988 and 1989 DC published a story called Cosmic Odyssey. It was a four-part series, and it was weird. It was a really, really weird story written by Jim Starlin, but it basically detailed this idea that there was just some being called anti-life, more or less, that it split itself into four parts, and it had gone to four different planets. But the idea was that Jon Stewart was a relatively new and pretty reckless Green Lantern when he was younger, and the result was that he teamed up with Martian Manhunter to try to find a way to basically keep Zanshi from being destroyed, due to the fact that if two of these planets were obliterated, the universe would be destroyed in its entirety. He basically screwed up, ran headlong into it, found this giant bomb in the middle of the planet, was too late to save it, and everybody on the planet died. Now, the funny thing about Jon Stewart is that he is basically a Green Lantern that did not initially rise to any real significant measure of popularity until Justice League came out in 2001. He was introduced 30 years earlier, in 1971. He basically served as a backup character throughout the entirety of the Green Lantern run, running all the way up through Emerald Twilight. He had involvement in all those stories, Zero Hour, Crisis in Time, and so on and so forth, up until Green Lantern Rebirth, which is where he began to increase in popularity even more among comic book readers, just because of the fact that his popularity in Justice League, the cartoon show, and then Green Lantern Rebirth basically set him to one of the higher echelons of characters. But the idea here is that because of the fact that Zanchi was a planet that he obliterated, what this does is it basically tells us that there is no limit to what it is that the Black Lantern rings can resurrect. They can recreate anything. Zanchi itself is resurrected as an entire planet to serve the purpose of operating alongside the Black Lantern lanterns. Now, this will eventually go into like Jon Stewart's own sub-story that will lead into the main Blackest Night story and actually see him do some pretty cool stuff. But what we end up doing here is we switch over to Zamoron, where the, the home of the Star Sapphires, as well as the Sinestro Corps. Now, one thing to keep in mind is in the aftermath of the Sinestro Corps War, there were a couple of things that had taken place. The first is that Sinestro himself had basically been defeated and captured, and the result was that the Green Lanterns were intent on taking him back to Oa to be put on trial. The problem with this was that in the middle of it all, the Green Lanterns were ambushed by a combination of the Red Lanterns, those who, you know, survived the Sinestro Core War, and even the Blue Lanterns themselves. And it led into this great big huge conflict, which I have a video on that you can check out down in the description. This is stuff that I suggest you check out the Green Lantern playlist just to get the full, you know, explanation of it. But the idea was that Atrocitus, the leader of the Red Lanterns, suddenly wanted to obliterate all lanterns in existence, wanted to just get rid of them all in their entirety. The idea was that this led into a series of skirmishes that took place between the, the Sinestro Corps, the Red Lanterns, the Blue Lanterns, the Green Lanterns. In addition to all this, one of the members of the Sinestro Corps named Amon Sur, the son of Abin Sur, who first gave Hal Jordan his Green Lantern, Amon Sur had basically eliminated the entire family of one of the Green Lanterns. And the result was that uh, this Lantern's friend had basically discovered what was going on and in her wrath killed Amon Sur, despite the fact that he was basically surrendering. The result was that Lyra herself was ousted from the Green Lanterns and in her rage was given a Red Lantern ring. And then that led into the whole skirmish of the Green Lantern showing up, Thal Sinestro being captured, so on and so forth. In an effort to basically try to turn Lyra away from being a Red Lantern because of the fact that she was one of the original Green Lanterns, Thal Sinestro had actually killed her while Hal Jordan was trying to reason with her. Hal Jordan eventually became a Red Lantern, different things like that. But this all basically goes towards this idea that the Sinestro Corps itself was experiencing what amounted to a civil war in the sense that you had Thal Sinestro who had finally been captured by the Green Lanterns and was being held prisoner. While that was going on,
on a villain named Mongol, who is by and large as strong, if not stronger than Superman, depending on what stories you're, you're reading, was given a yellow lantern ring himself, and then basically co-opted leadership of the Sinestro Corps and took it over in Sinestro's absence. And so what you basically had were members of the Sinestro Corps who were loyal to Mongol and those who were loyal to Sinestro. The result was that when everything popped off and when everything started going to pot and it all started going awry, Sinestro made his escape, he was out, he grabbed those who were faithful, and then tracked down the Star Sapphires, which leads us here. Now, the reason why he's here for these Star Sapphires is because of the fact that these Star Sapphires are based on love. And so what they did is they took a whole bunch of members of the Sinestro Corps and they started putting them in these crystals of sorts that would basically convert them to Star Sapphires. Sinestro showing up here simply serves the purpose of grabbing, you know, his members of the Sinestro Corps, bringing them back, and then eventually going back, killing Mongol, and then taking back over his Sinestro Corps. Again, with this idea of the Red Lanterns, transitioning back to Ismal, this is still the aftermath of all this stuff. Lyra's still dead, the Green Lanterns are still trying to make their escape, they're dealing with the Red Lanterns themselves, and then suddenly Black Lantern rings just start descending on everyone. So again, that's why there's so much back and forth here. That's why there's so much jumping around, is because we're talking about a war across the universe with these Black Lantern rings seemingly showing up out of nowhere. Now, the other half of this is that Star Sapphires effectively have the ability to tap into the emotions of people by way of love. And in an attempt that's made by Carol Ferris, who was formerly a lover of, uh, of Hal Jordan, the first Star Sapphire, and then ultimately rechristened with the Star Sapphire gem again, uh, is that she had actually encased Sinestro in this crystal of love, more or less, and tried to convert him or tried to begin the process of converting him. Now, under normal circumstances, what happens is that if a person's not powerful enough, when they're encased in crystal, they'll basically just kind of begin to, to shut down, go into a comatose state, and the conversion process will begin. But they can still resist it. They can refute the conversion. This is designed to show us how powerful Sinestro is. That where the other members of the Sinestro Corps are trying to resist this conversion, and it's taking quite a lot of time for it to happen, as soon as he's put into a crystal by, by Carol Ferris, he immediately shatters out of it. Because it's basically this idea that he is, in a lot of ways, the walking, talking, living embodiment of fear. Now, the problem with this is that in the middle of their skirmish, much like the skirmish between the Red Lanterns and the Green Lanterns and all that stuff, we're basically met with the arrival of the Black Lanterns. And so again, that's why I say all this takes place over the course of the first four issues, is because this is basically all these different groups in the middle of their ongoing conflicts, basically in the middle of this War of Light. And then suddenly the Black Lanterns start appearing out of nowhere. The other half of this is the Orange Lantern Larflees, who's basically kind of an outlier. When it comes to all the Lantern Corps that exist in DC Comics, they effectively have this governing rule in the sense that only those who are able to overcome great fear can become Green Lanterns. Only those who are basically able to manipulate fear and use that fear to empower themselves can become Sinestro Corps members, so on and so forth. Larflees is not like any of the other cores. Larflees is the orange lantern of greed, of avarice. And so the idea is that he has the whole of the lantern core power to himself, which makes him insane in terms of the kind of things that he can do. But the idea here is that because the blue lanterns were so intriguing to Larflees, when the opportunity arose, which we had covered previously, for him to basically capture the blue lanterns, when he was introduced to the idea that they exist, he basically took all of his constructs and just sent them all directly to the blue lanterns themselves. Now, that's the inherent difference between Larflees as an Orange Lantern and everybody else. All the other Lantern Corps have multiple members, the Blue Lanterns, the Red Lanterns, the Green Lanterns, Yellow Lanterns. But with Larflees, his core is consists of constructs. Anyone he's ever killed becomes a construct. They become something for him to control. The problem with this is that, again, with Larflees having killed so many people, his base of operations is a giant graveyard. It means when Black Lantern rings start descending onto Larflees' base of operations, it's nothing but Black Lantern lanterns that start rising everywhere. It's just him by himself, but his power is extreme. And we'll actually find out just how powerful he is uh, in the next few videos or so. But the idea is that again, this is why the blue lanterns are fighting the orange lanterns is because it's the constructs of Larflees trying to overpower the blue lanterns and then take their rings from them. So he can just hoard the rings for himself. It's just this giant treasure trove, you know, that he essentially keeps around. And so the idea here is that with this war of light going on, with the black lanterns rising themselves, what it does, 
does is it begins to shift its focus to the idea of the indigo tribe. Now, before we jump into that, what we actually end up doing is picking up with the Green Lantern core line of stories, which is to say all the other Green Lanterns that are out there minus Hal Jordan. And the idea here is that this picks up in the aftermath of a story called Emerald Eclipse. Now, Emerald Eclipse, we didn't cover. We didn't really have a reason to just because the entire basis of the story we could explain later on within the span of five or six minutes. But the whole idea of Emerald Eclipse is it was basically DC finally finding a way to deal with the character of Sodom Yacht. For those of you guys who don't know, Sodom Yacht is what's called a Daxamite. And Daxamites live on the planet Daxam. Somewhere along the line in DC's history, some Kryptonians basically left the planet of Krypton and then took up residence on Daxam. Over time, they basically became xenophobic. The result is that as time progressed, if somebody from another, another planet or something like that showed up on their home, they would basically be destroyed or something along those lines. Sodom Yacht hails from that race of people. Much like Superman, if he's exposed to a yellow sun, he'll develop Superman powers. The idea was that as a child, he had come across what amounted to a spacefaring explorer crash landing on his home world. And his, his actual existence was kept hidden away from everybody just so that they wouldn't, you know, freak out when he was there. But through this explorer, Sodom Yacht learned about the greater universe, about the Green Lantern Corps and all these different races that exist out there and so on and so forth. The problem was that when this explorer was discovered, he was basically taken, killed, and stuffed by the Daxams themselves. This created an absolute hatred for his own race and their xenophobic views at the hands of, uh, of Sodom Yacht. In response to this, when he was given the opportunity to become a Green Lantern, he immediately took it. Now, he became significant in the Green Lantern mythos for two reasons. The first is because it was believed that if someone like Superman ever became a Green Lantern, they'd be the most powerful lantern in existence because it's basically the powers of Superman combined with the powers of a lantern ring. And so that would be hitherto almost unchecked powers. The other half of this is that he was destined to become the new Ion. When DC originally launched the events of Emerald Twilight and uh, Zero Hour Crisis in Time, how Jordan became possessed by Parallax, all that kind of good stuff, he eliminated almost the entirety of the Green Lantern Corps. Kyle Rayner basically became a being called Ion, which basically allowed him to house the entity in the sense that he was basically able to single-handedly resurrect the entirety of the Green Lanterns. That's what the Ion entity is. Should all the Green Lanterns be killed, the Ion can bring them all back. He can basically bring back the Guardians and the Central Power Battery and all that kind of stuff. The whole idea is that because Sodom Yacht was so powerful, during the events of uh, Mongol running the Sinestro Corps, he basically invaded uh, the planet of Daxam. Sodom Yacht intervened, and in the midst of it all, basically took the Red Sun or flew himself into the Red Sun and then used his own energies and converted it into a Yellow Sun, gave all of his people Superman powers, and they fought off the Sinestro Corps. And that's basically it. That's the gist of it. But the idea is that he was believed to have been left for dead. He was believed to have died. Now he didn't, and he'll come back during the events of Brightest Day. But at the time, he was believed to have been gone, and it allowed DC to put him on the back burner. But while there isn't a whole lot of meat and potatoes to the Green Lantern Corps story, what this basically does, or at least in terms of this story, is it deals with the idea that with these Black Lantern rings descending on all these different people, everybody's having to deal with it in their own way. For the character of Kyle Rayner, he basically sees this sort of reincarnation of the character Jade, the daughter of the Green Lantern Alan Scott, who Kyle Rayner had been in love with and who had ultimately died. Because of the fact that Jade, alongside almost all the other girlfriends that he's had, have all perished in tragic circumstances, it's a haunting factor of Kyle Rayner. That's one of the reasons why he never really gets into relationships, or if he does, it's tedious. Because for him, he's always afraid the girlfriend he has is going to get quote unquote stuffed in a refrigerator. That's the big concern that goes on in his mind when it comes to other people. The other half of this is it actually shows how sadistic the Black Lanterns are in the sense that they actually bust into a uh, infirmary for the most part where all these Green Lanterns are healing from various injuries, the conflicts they've been in, and they literally go in and just start tearing out their hearts. I mean, it's pretty intense in terms of what it is that they end up doing here. But again, this is the first appearance of the Black Lantern Rings to a vast majority of the Green Lantern Corps. So again, it's pretty cool in terms of how it all unfolds. But jumping back to Sinestro, jumping back to the Black Lanterns, the fact that these Black Lanterns are basically emerging, two of the most important ones come in the form form of Amonsor and Aronsor. Now, Aaron Soar was, at one time, the only person that Sinestro had actually loved. And Saranik Natu is the daughter of Aaron Soar and Sinestro himself. We learned that during the events of... 
forgot, I want to say it was when the Red Lanterns captured uh, Sinestro himself. But the idea here is that facing off against these Black Lanterns, keep in mind, the Black Lanterns themselves basically feed on emotion. The whole idea is that they are basically emotional batteries in the sense that they force all these different people they come across to feel fear or rage or whatever the case may be. And those emotions charge up that person's heart. And when that person's heart is charged, the Black Lanterns take their hearts, consume them, and all that energy feeds the central power battery. The reason why that's important is because when the central power battery is at 100%, the entity that represents the Black Lantern core is Necron himself, and it will allow him to enter the realm of the living. That's why this is a huge deal. And so again, that's why this is so huge is because in the middle of this all, the Indigo tribe finally steps in. And the whole goal here is for them to essentially be the voice of reason, the voice of logic. And they will be the ones who will basically come together and say, we have to unite the Lantern Corps against the Blackest Knight. We cannot let them battle because if we do, then what this will do is it will basically live up to the prophecy. And so with that in mind, the Indigo tribe, Indigo One, at least the leader of the Indigo tribe, basically grabs Sinestro and takes him directly to Mongol because the whole idea here is to eliminate Mongol and reunite the Sinestro Corps because they need every single living member of every single Lantern Corps and more to defeat the Black Lanterns. It's a coming together of every living being in existence to fight off against the Black Lanterns and have it come to a head in a massive battle. Thal Sinestro is just one with his own Lantern Corps. He knows how to use it in a way that nobody else does. Mongol is just this heavy hitter. He's just this slugger. That's really all it is. He's really, really smart and he's very capable, but he's not a master of the Sinestro Corps. Sinestro actually overpowers and eliminates Mongol right off the bat. And so what this does is it basically leads into this idea that we're going to see the return of the Sinestro Corps and we're eventually going to see a continued call to arms. All these Lantern Corps coming together to join the Earth's superheroes and face off against the Black Lantern Corps, which will ultimately lead into the rise of the White Lanterns. Okay, so continuing our discussions on Blackest Night, at this point we pick up with the second part, and this focuses partly on the Green Lantern Corps and the second half on the Green Lantern title itself, again, much like we did in the previous video. Now, in the last video, we had basically dealt with this idea that there were two things happening in the universe at the same time. I mean, the Black Lantern rings are basically these rings that attach themselves to those who have been deceased, and they resurrect them for the purpose of emotionally charging other individuals, so that when those individuals' hearts are just filled with all different types of emotions, the Black Lantern takes their heart, consumes it, and it feeds their central power battery, charging it up to 100%. Now, the idea here is that in the last video, we basically mentioned that the Black Lantern rings basically spreading throughout the universe was a massive calamity because what it meant is that individuals who had died across the universe were being resurrected no matter what planet they were on. And we even saw entire planets being resurrected by the Black Lantern rings. Now, of course, all this goes towards the entity of Necron, which is to say in the DC universe, when it comes to the emotional spectrum, you've got entities that represent those spectrums. They're not really gods. They're really more just kind of like avatars. And so Necron is kind of this living embodiment of death, so to speak. But the idea here is that the goal of the Black Lanterns is to basically charge the central power battery to 100% so that it will basically open a gateway and allow Necron to enter the living realm. And all of this is important because of the fact that this feeds into the War of Light. It feeds into the rise of the Black Lanterns. All these Lantern Corps going to war against one another. While that's happening, the Black Lanterns rising to prominence, ultimately, eliminating all life in existence and then ushering in this basically blackest night, this eternal darkness in the universe. And so with the Green Lantern Corps, this again focuses on basically everybody except for Hal Jordan, the main Green Lantern, quote unquote, in the DC universe. And so we basically end up picking up with like Saronic Natu and, and these characters. And we had talked about how the Black Lanterns were really sadistic because they would basically kill anybody. In this instance, it was the Black Lanterns going to the infirmary of the Green Lantern Corps. And then with those individuals who were effectively injured or who were basically unable to defend themselves, the Black Lanterns would terrify them and when their hearts were charged, they would just seize them and take their hearts out of their bodies. So they were basically killing helpless people. So it's pretty insane in terms of how that unfolds. But again, that becomes significant because it's like classic zombie infection. The more zombies there are, the more zombies there become. Just because the Black Lanterns, once they kill someone, a Black Lantern ring suddenly bonds to that person and the numbers bolster even further. And so that's what this is. This is a continuation of the idea that the Green Lantern Corps 
for is basically coming to the realization that the dead are rising in the form of black lanterns and the goal is to get as many people out there as they possibly can the problem with this is that each individual member or at least the most prominent members of the green lanterns are dealing with the black lanterns in their own individual way now this is something that happens across the board for Saronic not to she's basically the the top medic the top doctor of the green lantern corps and so to see individuals being killed and then turned into black lanterns is her own way of basically having to deal with it being confronted by the black lantern concept now this means that the black lanterns themselves will fill her heart with emotion with rage with fear with willpower so on and so forth and they'll try to take her out as well but what had happened over the course of the green lantern core line of stories by peter tomasi is he began focusing on this idea that a kind of affection was brewing between saronic natu and kyle rayner as a green lantern now in all honesty this just made good sense it's basically this idea that a lot of the girlfriends of kyle rayner were his were like you know heroic or they were very virtuous but with saronic natu she basically possesses all those character traits she's headstrong she's brave she's got the drive work counts she's got ambition her goal is to be one of the greatest green lanterns and so it was basically peter j tomasi coming along and saying we're going to introduce a love interest between kyle rayner and saronic natu but she's not going to go out the same way as everybody else the cool thing about this is that with kyle rayner's most recent girlfriend a girl by the name of jade who was basically the daughter of the green lantern alan scott what happened is that she essentially sacrificed her life in order to save kyle rayner also imbued him with something called the star heart which is basically a version of the green lantern energy from a different reality and the idea here was that it helped to bolster the powers of kyle rayner went towards him being ion we talked about that in a previous video but the long and short of this is that uh jade had basically been resurrected by a black lantern ring and much like all the black lanterns that we've seen so far the goal is emotional manipulation feed on their emotional state whatever relationship they have charge their hearts with energy and then take their heart when it's filled with emotion jade had initially appeared to kyle rayner as hey it's okay that i i pass you know that's that's the way things go but we can be together again and this kind of hope you know this blue lantern energy of hope filled kyle rayner it was also willpower it was also the belief that maybe things can work out but it was really kyle rayner putting on a ruse that he was playing along with jade to understand the motivations of what the black lanterns were looking for and that's when kyle rayner came to the realization the black lanterns are looking to charge people's hearts with emotion and then consume them now in the middle of all this because jade had such an emotional and psychological impact on kyle rayner it takes the intervention of saronic natu to sort of snap kyle rayner out completely in the sense that he's aware of what it is that jade's doing but his heart can't help but feel that maybe they can be together again now of course again saronic natu has no stake in jade she doesn't know jade she's never met jade and so saronic natu is the voice of reason here she's the one that essentially kind of defies it all and jumps into the fray now the other half of this are characters like kilowog right for kilowog he doesn't really have a whole lot of emotional attachments to other people that are out there for him he's the drill sergeant of the green lantern corps he's very militaristic in that fashion and so for him it's honor and duty above all else but as the drill sergeant for the green lantern every single green lantern that dies feels like it's the fault of kilowog and that's what the black lanterns feed on in his case it's this idea all these different from black lanterns out here that were formerly green lanterns who died in the line of duty they wouldn't have died if you'd done your job like you were supposed to and that's what fills them with rage because remember no matter what any of these green lantern core members feel the black lanterns will feed on it but one of the darkest moments comes from out of this when we basically find out that the children of crib have all come back as black lanterns now crib was a character who was i believe originally introduced in the sinestro core war but crib was basically this weird alien entity that essentially went on this pattern of killing green lanterns and then taking their children and making the children her own now she wasn't like abusing them or anything she would just take them whisk them off to some planet somewhere and say you are now my children but the idea is that for whatever reason that hasn't been explained yet these kids have all basically died now this can largely be due to the uh, be attributed to the fact that crib was the only one taking care of these kids and with crib basically having been captured by the green lanterns and then allowed to go with the xamarons the star sapphires these kids were just kind of left to their own devices and ultimately ended up just perishing according According to the environment but the problem is that in the middle of all this we end up having the arrival of one of the indigo lanterns now again when it comes to the black lanterns the only way to truly defeat them is to blast them with just a massive amount of just bright energy basically white light and the way in which you can pull that off is by combining rings together or something along those lines by blasting them with a massive amount of light energy what it does is it creates a feedback in the ring basically causes the ring to essentially overload and the result is that this feedback resonates throughout the black lantern themselves and they simply just explode. 
But what this does, you know, with the arrival of these kids, with the arrival of the Indigo tribe showing up and basically helping the Green Lanterns to stave off the Black Lantern Corps, we switch our focus to the Red Lanterns. Now, again, we talked about this in the last video in the sense that the Red Lanterns were basically dealing with the aftermath of the Green Lanterns trying to retrieve one of their own who had previously perished. And in the middle of this whole conflict, you know, with the Green Lanterns being the only ones really left there, the Black Lantern rings started descending on everybody. And what happens is four of the five inversions are basically resurrected. Now, the fifth inversion is Atrocitus himself, the person who created the Red Lantern Corps. But to provide a little bit of history, for those of you guys who are watching this video for the first time, the first thing I would suggest is checking out the origin of the Red Lanterns. That way you'll fully understand who the five inversions are. But the long and short of this is that before the Green Lanterns were ever created by the Guardians of the Universe, the Guardians of the Universe had created the Manhunters. And the Manhunters were basically just robots. And the belief of the Guardians is that because the robots only do what they're told, they're the perfect form to basically police the universe, to make sure that there's no credible threats with regards to people trying to obliterate planets or anything along those lines. The problem is that the, the Manhunters malfunction, and we'll actually find out later on down the line that it was one of the Guardians themselves that caused it to happen. But the idea is that with the Manhunters basically going awry, they traveled to Sector 666 and basically killed everyone. And so what ended up happening is the survivors of Sector 666, these five inversions, came together in their hatred for the Guardians of the Universe and began the process of plotting and trying to find a way to eliminate the Guardians in their entirety, along with the newly formed Green Lantern Corps. And so where Atrocitus was one of the five inversions, and it basically seen a vision of the future with regards to what's actually happening right now, what he in turn did is killed the other four inversions and then created the Red Lantern Corps. And so that's why these inversions are resurrecting, is because these are the people that Atrocitus killed. And so in this instance, with the four inversions popping up as Black Lanterns, Atrocitus is fearless and doesn't care. Because he's so full with rage, because rage is the one governing force of his life, his heart was already charged with full emotion. But the caveat to this, and remember, when it comes to the Red Lanterns, when they're given a Red Lantern ring, it replaces their heart. And so where the Black Lanterns attack Atrocitus for the purpose of taking his heart and consuming it, his heart will inevitably regrow. Now, this has both a benefit and a drawback. The benefit is that they can't kill Atrocitus by tearing his heart out, which means the Red Lanterns cannot be killed by the Black Lanterns, and the Red Lanterns themselves cannot become Black Lanterns, unless, of course, the ring is taken away. The drawback to this is they are basically an infinite source of emotion. As long as they keep, like, Red Lanterns prisoner, Black Lanterns could literally just repeatedly tear out their hearts and consume them until they charge the central power battery. That's why this threat of the Black Lanterns has to be dealt with as fast as humanly possible. But in this instance, because Atrocitus is basically the living embodiment of rage, the Black Lanterns don't stand a chance. You know, him blasting them with massive amounts of energy and so on and so forth, again, causes these Black Lanterns to come crashing down. And so what this does is basically transition to this third part of the story, this last little bit, where we basically pick up with Hal Jordan the Green Lantern, we pick up with Sinestro, and we pick up with the Indigo Tribe, as well as the Star Sapphire. This comes out of the idea that with Sinestro having been imprisoned by the Green Lanterns after the event of the Sinestro Corps War, it allowed a villain by the name of Mongol, one of the most notable enemies in DC, and someone who's basically equal to Superman in strength in a lot of ways, to rise to power after receiving a Yellow Lantern ring, and then basically take over the Sinestro Corps himself. And so what this did is once Thal Sinestro was freed from his imprisonment in the midst of the rise of the Black Lanterns, he went out, he basically tried to seize back control of his Sinestro Corps, and the first stop was Zamoron, the home of the Star Sapphires, because the Star Sapphires had taken a number of the Sinestro Corps and tried to convert them into Star Sapphires. And so because of that, Sinestro arriving is also met with the Indigo Tribe, you know, Indigo One, who had basically snatched Hal Jordan from Earth, brought him over to Zamoron in an effort to basically start uniting the different cores. And again, that's the basis of the Indigo Tribe. The Indigo Tribe is the Lantern Corps of Compassion, but they're also the Lantern Corps of Reason and Logic. And so this basically puts us where we are right now with regards to a little bit of infighting in the sense that we have Hal Jordan and Sinestro bickering among one another, but it's basically this idea that we have to begin working together. We have to function as a cohesive unit because if we don't, this war of light will consume us all and the Black Lanterns will just bring about the end of all things in the universe. So ultimately what this does is again, this picks up a little bit with regards to the Blue Lanterns and the Orange Lanterns. Remember, the Orange Lanterns are basically the Lantern Corps of Greed, of Avarice. But instead of having an actual core, it's basically just Larflees himself in the sense that his core consists of constructs. But the Blue Lanterns are basically a Lantern Corps based on hope. It's the idea that no matter how bad things get, there's always a way to overcome things. And so the power of the Blue Lanterns can only really stand some measure when it's accompanied by the powers of the Green Lanterns. The Green Lanterns are kind of the foundation 
information that powers the Blue Lantern Corps. And that's why in this instance, despite the fact that the Blue Lanterns are largely considered to be the most powerful, they're really struggling against the Orange Lanterns because there's no, no Green Lanterns there to bolster their own power. But this changes when Indigo One brings Hal Jordan and Sinestro and Star Sapphire directly to where it is the Blue Lanterns are at. Because again, the Green Lanterns bolster the Blue Lantern power and the Blue Lantern rings can supercharge the Green Lantern rings. So they're designed to basically work together. But this allows the uh, Blue Lanterns the power they need facing against Larflees. The problem is that in the middle of all this, all the orange constructs vanish. And the reason for this is because Larflees recalled them all to himself because of the fact that, again, the Black Lantern ranks descended on Larflees' base of operations and began bonding themselves to all these people Larflees had killed in his greed and in his hubris. And so with this in mind, the Larflees basically begins to panic and basically begins to run off, but is met by the arrival of Atrocitus, who basically shows up having defeated all four inversions and the Black Lanterns on his own home planet with the intention of not only seizing the Orange Lantern ring for himself, but using it with his own abilities because what it would do is it would bolster the power of the Red Lanterns in terms of the fact that he's able to use two different rings at the same time. So again, Atrocitus' motivation is to still take out all the different Lantern Corps to basically ensure that the Guardians of the Universe are defeated and so on and so forth. He's not yet been recruited to the cause of all the other Lanterns. He's not yet been told, here's everything that's going on. He's aware of the Prophecy of Blackest Night. He's aware of what it means, but he doesn't really seem to grasp the idea that if the Prophecy of Blackest Night rises to its full fruition, everybody will die, including him and the Red Lanterns themselves. Okay, so jumping back into Blackest Night again, uh, this is when everything begins to change, and this is cool, because for those of you guys who are following or who saw our very first Blackest Night video, which was basically the main Blackest Night story issues one through four, this finally brings us to the point whereby the central power battery is completely charged, and this begins the process of allowing Necron, the living embodiment of death in the DC universe, to begin moving into the realm of reality. And initially, it's not like this right off the bat. It's this continued fight against Against all these different members of the Black Lantern Corps. Now remember, when it comes to the Indigo tribe, because they're the logical and the reasonable, one, uh, reasonable ones, they're the ones who immediately picked up the clues right off the bat on how to defeat the Black Lanterns. It's basically just a massive amount of light. Now the way in which this comes about is with one of the uh, members of the Indigo tribe, the second in command, speaking with one of the other Green Lanterns. And while they're facing off against all these, you know, these Black Lanterns, the question's asked, how is it that we're able to kill them the way we are? And the response of the member of the Indigo Indigo tribe is to simply say, I can combine my light with your light and we can in turn destroy the Black Lantern rings. The issue with this is that it has to be concentrated. It cannot be a wide burst. It cannot be a scatter shot. And that's what's established here because the question asked by the Green Lantern at hand is, well, why don't we just like fly up into the air and just broadcast our light everywhere? And the reason why is because they're only dealing with so much light. They only have so much to go around. And so the response is if they were to fly up into the atmosphere and if they were to use this, what they would basically do is blow blanket the Black Lanterns in light, but it wouldn't be concentrated enough to actually destroy their rings. But all of that amounts to a zero sum anyway, because in the middle of this conflict, the Black Lanterns stop, and then they all take off with the command to devour Will due to the fact that the central power battery for the Black Lanterns is fully charged at 100%. Now what this does is it gives us the other half of the equation. Well, the first part of this, which we talked about in the last video, was basically consuming emotionally charged hearts after forcing individuals to feel all these different emotions when their loved ones came back as Black Lanterns, the other half is to eliminate anybody who can basically be a threat. Because remember, if the Black Lanterns were to fight these Green Lanterns and try to kill them, there's always going to be more Green Lanterns. Remember, that's the basis of the Green Lantern Corps, that whenever a Green Lantern dies, its ring immediately goes out and seeks a new host. But to beat them to the punch, what they do is try to strip the Green Lanterns of their source of energy. They go directly after the central power battery, remove its connection to the emotional spectrum, and in turn, no matter how many Green Lantern rings there are out there, they'll simply just cease functioning. And the other half of this scenario is the Green Lanterns facing off with it the absolute best they can, stemming this flow of, of Black Lanterns. Because essentially, every Black Lantern in the vicinity on the planet of Oa, and even some from other parts of the cosmos, are all traveling directly to destroy the central power battery. But, I mean, look at this. Look at the sheer number of Black Lanterns here. That's not all of them. And so hopefully that gives you some indication as to how many Black Lanterns are floating out there in the cosmos 
cosmos, how many black lanterns are fighting, however many other beings exist out there. And so in this instance, where they basically try to pull the central power battery, the efforts of the green lanterns are, virtu are virtually non-existent. There's really nothing they can do. At the same time, the red lanterns show up. The red lanterns showing up is to help the green lanterns defeat the black lanterns. But again, because of the fact that the black, uh, black lantern rings need concentrated beams of light in order to basically be destroyed, in the end, the hatred from the red lanterns means they're just mindless beasts attacking things. And so that's all they know. All they know is to go to the black lanterns and attack the black lanterns. Where for all the good it does, they might as well be, you know, beating a metal wall with a wooden baseball bat. It's not going to do them any good. And with all these black lanterns coming together and pulling out the central power battery, Kyle Rayner is the one who saves the day. Because what Kyle Rayner does is travel and basically grab the source of the alpha lantern's power, kind of like this, uh, this center core of the central, uh, central power battery, basically yank it out, take it to where the black lanterns are at and detonate it. He effectively seems to kill himself in the explosion, but it does let off this massive amount of green lantern energy. And when that happens, it does begin the process of taking out a lot of these black lanterns, but not all of them. Some of these black lanterns are still there. And so in this instance, when Kyle Rayner dies, Guy Gardner, loses it. I mean, absolutely snaps. And in this moment where he's so angry, he suddenly bonded with a red lantern ring. Now, remember when it comes to the red lanterns, you don't get to choose to be one. You don't get to say like, yes, I'm down for being a red lantern. No, the ring finds you and just forces itself onto you. As a red lantern, literally just losing all semblance of self-control, he's wielding a red lantern ring and a green lantern ring. It allows him to achieve the very goal that the red lanterns and the green lanterns were trying to accomplish by merging the lights together and allowing him to cut an absolute swath through the Black Lantern core. I mean, he literally starts ripping these guys to pieces bit by bit. Now, in the middle of all this is Saronic Natu, the medic of the uh, of the Green Lantern Corps, who is in love with Kyle Rayner, trying to bring him back because he's not quite dead yet. He's basically in the process of dying, his heart slowing down and, and all that kind of good stuff. But the other half is that he's constantly being beset by Black Lantern rings. They're constantly driving to bond themselves to him and resurrect him as a Black Lantern. Now, of course, the Indigo tribe coming to the aid helps a little bit, but at the end of the day, they're, you're talking about thousands of rings that are going to start making their way to where Kyle Rayner is. And that's the craziness of the situation is because it's the actions of Guy Gardner as a red and green lantern destroying the Black Lantern Corps that are making things even more dangerous for Kyle Rayner. And so this is when we start to get the other half of the equation of all these different tribes beginning to come together in the sense that the star sapphires being so imbued with love of helping others feel love that their ring goes off whenever somebody is feeling heartbroken. And in this instance, one of the star sapphires, her ring goes off when Saronic Natu basically begins to lose hope in the idea that she'll be able to resurrect Kyle Rayner, that she's heartbroken because she may lose the man she loves. And in that moment, this star sapphire comes flying to the rescue. Through their ability to manipulate the emotional spectrum aspect of love, they can help bring people back. They are as much healers as they are individuals who spread love. Now, again, they're very parasitic in terms of how their uh, how their Lantern core works, but that's why they're not these saints is because they're just as inclined to encase you in crystal and convert you to a star sapphire as they are to actually help you out. Bringing Kyle Rayner back by passing the love of Saronic Natu to Kyle Rayner himself serves the purpose of allowing the story to continue on. And what ends up happening here is Kyle Rayner gets his ring back and goes forward as a Green Lantern, helping to cast off off the rest of these Black Lanterns, along with the question being asked, how are they going to get the ring off of Guy Gardner? With Guy Gardner being probably one of the most important Green Lanterns because of how amazing he is, the goal is to find a Blue Lantern that can remove the ring from him. Now, moving into the last little tidbit of our tie-ins before we actually jump back into the main Green Lantern story itself, we pick up with what's probably the coolest tie-in, which is everybody versus the Red Lanterns. <laughs> it's the Orange Lanterns and the Blue Lanterns and the Star Sapphires and the Indigo Tribe and the Green Lanterns against Atrocitus. <laughs> and it's really cool. What this does is it picks up in the aftermath of Atrocitus chasing after uh, the Orange Lantern Larflees. And so the whole idea is that he actually actually seizes the orange lantern battery from Larflees himself and then in turn just becomes obsessed with greed and it's interesting because we don't really get you know usually get to see things like that but in the middle of this whole thing he's met with Sinestro and Saint Walker of the Blue Lanterns and Hal Jordan of the Green Lanterns and Carol Ferris of the Star Sapphires and Indigo One um, and where there's a little bit of bickering and a little bit of arguing between all these different things once it all settles down we actually end up learning a few things that took place now a lot of this is a misunderstanding or looking at something in a compartmental 
normalized fashion as opposed to the overarching thing in the sense that Sinestro starts making the case well you know you Hal Jordan were the one who went to the planet went to the Vegas system where Larflees resided which violated the treaty between the Guardians and Larflees but you did it at the request of the Guardians and you showed up on Ismalt the home of the Red Lanterns because you were trying to rescue me because the Guardians wanted you to you were doing all these things the Guardians wanted you to do and you were the one who set the War of Light in motion which is kind of true to a degree but not necessarily the War of Light was not set off by any one thing it was a litany of different things all happening at the same time that all actually culminated with Sinestro himself in the sense that Sinestro had basically waged war against the Green Lanterns in the Sinestro Corps War the Guardians allowed the Green Lanterns to start killing people and in this instance it basically started off as these small little pot shots here and there Lyra a Green Lantern who killed a member of the Sinestro Corps wasn't she when she wasn't supposed to it was Mongol taking over the Sinestro Corps in the absence of Sinestro himself and then using the Corps to basically implement his own campaigns which led to the Green Lanterns and the Sinestro Corps fighting each other again it was Larflees basically believing that the treaty between himself and the Guardians had been violated when the Green Lanterns led by Hal Jordan showed up there the Blue Lantern Corps being created by Ganthet and Sade it was the rise of the Black Lanterns it was all these things that came together and culminated in the War of Light so in truth if it's anybody's fault it's everyone's fault because everybody ha everybody had a hand in it somehow but the coolest thing about this is that it really asked the question if we had to define an actual person who was responsible you know which person would that be and the argument presented here in the story is that it's actually Atrocitus because Atrocitus was the one who originally saw the prophecy of Blackest Night and realized what was going to happen with the War of Light who taunted Abin Sur the Green Lantern that gave Hal Jordan his ring and it was Abin Sur who basically told everybody about the prophecy of Blackest Night and the War of Light so maybe that's the case but again that's the nature of how this thing plays out and it's the nature of what Jeff Johns is kind of pointing out here that in any one particular scenario barring a person going in and then just committing a series of linear acts it's never any one particular person's fault when it comes to this there's equal blame all around everybody screwed up equally <laughs> that's basically the scenario here again the cool thing about this is that people try to talk reason to what's going on with Atrocitus the fact that he's so driven by rage and he's so angry but notice this there is somewhat of a measure of respect among these various members of the Lantern Corps and the Guardians of the Universe Ganthet and Sade because they realize the stakes are much higher than their own individual petty squabbles I mean looking at someone like Thal Sinestro in his mind it's his way or the highway there's the way he wants things to be and then there's everybody else who's wrong but in this scenario he's bargaining he's telling look like hey Atrocitus I will work with you if you ally with us and we'll destroy the Green Lantern Corps remember they have a mutual hatred for the Green Lanterns it's Larfley saying yeah sure I mean I'll join too but like I want my own guardian like I want a guardian of the universe for myself that's just Larfley's being greedy because that's his whole thing he's just a super greedy guy but these people who would never work together are effectively finding common ground if for no other reason than self-preservation the Black Lanterns have united the Lantern Corps together and their desire to not die it's a selfish motivation but selfish is not inherently an evil thing in this particular story it's cool because it's people coming together for a singular cause it's people coming together and basically working together and that's the beauty of the Indigo tribe is because remember the Indigo tribe is the voice of reason they're the voice of logic they're the ones that do not allow themselves to get caught up in petty squabbles and so what happens is Indigo 1 actually takes all the members here from these Lantern Corps and teleports them to Ismal to the home of Atrocitus and this is important because Atrocitus actually begins to feel some measure of compassion but it's him sitting down and finding common ground with the other Lantern Corps because in the mind of Atrocitus he's not necessarily a villain by and large when it comes to comic books we usually define villains in a subjective way which means that we don't all define villains the exact same way but for the most part I define villains as people who do bad things because they can not because there's any real motivation to it but because they're just like I can commit this crime so I'm going to commit this crime like I just want a lot of money that's how I would define a villain Atrocitus as a Red Lantern looks to destroy the Green Lanterns and the Guardians of the Universe but notice this it's not because he can he doesn't say like I want to eliminate the Guardians of the Universe and the Green Lanterns because because I just don't like the fact that the Guardians are blue and small and I just don't like the Green Lanterns because I hate the color green it's nothing like that it's basically him saying my people were wiped out because the Guardians of the universe were foolish and they were arrogant and they believed they could police the universe with robots and those robots destroyed everything I knew and loved and I will go to the ends of the earth I will I will go to the end of time I will do whatever I have to to eliminate the Guardians of the universe not because I hate them but because I want to make sure they cannot keep making stupid decisions that will result in the loss of life of innocent people and so while his motivations are extreme he's not really a villain he's not really a bad guy in the traditional sense and 
And that's what's so cool about this is it takes the character as we perceive him and dumps him on his head. It literally just flips the script on the whole thing. And so in the end, in this recognition, Atrocitus basically allies himself with this lantern core and says, fine, I don't want innocent life to be wiped out by the Black Lanterns. I believe innocent life should continue to thrive. If the Black Lanterns are the immediate threat to innocent people, then I will do my best to keep them alive. I will do my best to save those innocent lives. But as soon as this is done, as soon as this is over, and as soon as this threat is quelled, you can bet all the money in your pockets that I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you as a Guardians of the Universe, and I'm coming for you as a Green Lanterns. And woe betide you if anything doesn't get in my way. I will literally bring everything you know and love crashing down. So basically it's this idea that once we're done with Blackest Night, it's business as usual, and business is good. Now, the whole idea is that every single member of the Lantern Corps, I guess every every uh, part of the emotional spectrum, which is to say all the Lantern Corps have an entity. Necron is like the emotional aspect of death, if death could be an emotion. The whole idea here is that when it came to the various superheroes who have died over the years, one of the big questions people had is, if these superheroes have died, how are they alive now? Well, the great thing about this is that Jeff Johns comes along and he says, okay, none of these superheroes actually died. And this conversation, this whole, you know, taunting by William Hand and Necron and so on, what we end up learning is that Barry Allen was supposed to have died. During the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, when he broke down on the molecular level, he was supposed to go to the afterlife. He was supposed to be dead. Necron got in their way and stopped them from dying and sent them back, and that's how they lived. Now, the other half of this is, remember, the only real spacefaring force that's capable of dealing with these Black Lanterns is the Green Lantern Corps, and like we covered in previous videos, they're dealing with the Black Lanterns off in space, and so it's basically just the Earth's superheroes. So we have, like, the Teen Titans and the Justice League and you know, all these different superhero groups that come together to try to face off against Necron and all these Black Lanterns. Remember, this is almost like a losing war, right? Like these guys, it's a stopgap measure. That's all it is. It's them jumping in and trying to destroy these Black Lantern rings. Because remember, the only way a Black Lantern ring can truly be destroyed is if a massive amount of light from multiple sources is basically just thrown at these Black Lantern rings. And so you'd have to have somebody like Dr. Light who can manipulate light. You'd have to have like multiple cores coming together and firing all their rings at the same time and channeling those energies in order to destroy them. And the whole idea of channeling their energies comes to bear for the various leaders of the Lantern Corps to basically put their energies together into the Black Lantern Central Power Battery. Remember, the Black Lantern Central Power Battery, like all the other Central Power Batteries, is basically where the Black Lanterns get their power from. And so the whole idea is if they destroy the Central Power Battery, it'll do two things. The first is it'll basically deactivate all the Black Lantern rings, and the second is it'll send Necron back to his own realm, to wherever it was that he came from. The problem is it doesn't work <laughs> because it's so much power and so much energy, it's almost impossible to do. And so what ends up happening here in probably one of the greatest moments in the history of comics, these rings start flying out. One of them says, Bruce Wayne of Earth, rise. So Bruce Wayne, like Bruce Wayne, Mur! Bruce Wayne's dead and ends up coming back. And it's one of the coolest things. Now remember, this is not really Bruce Wayne. Like it's not really the essence of Bruce Wayne, the spirit of Bruce Wayne, it's his body. It's basically the Black Lantern rings reconstituting Bruce Wayne's body and then using it as a vector. But when it comes to Bruce Wayne, he is probably one of the single most important characters in all of the DC landscape for a bunch of different reasons. One of the first reasons is because of the fact that everyone is tethered to him and that's why he was brought back. But the whole idea is that whether they trust him, whether they don't trust him, whether they love him, whether they hate him, everybody in some form or fashion is connected emotionally to Bruce Wayne. And so because of this, using this emotional tether of Bruce Wayne in the shock of the moment, all of these guys guys are basically bonded with Black Lantern rings, and we end up with the Black Lantern Justice League. The only exception to this is Hal Jordan and Barry Allen. At this point, we switch over to Jon Stewart. Now, Jon Stewart is one of those Green Lanterns where he basically achieved the height of his popularity during the Justice League cartoon show. He predates that show by like 30 years, but he was just one of those Green Lanterns out there. And in the end, despite the fact that he was introduced back then, despite the fact that he was amazing, it didn't much matter because the Green Lantern titles weren't selling anyway. But with the Justice League cartoon show, he was the only Green Lantern on that show. <laughs> and so it was a way to just bolster, bolster him up, say, hey, you want a Green Lantern? You get Jon Stewart and nobody else. But in this instance, one of the things to remember, and one of the things we talked about before, was Jon Stewart in his younger days. Jon Stewart was a member of the Marines, and then eventually he became a Green Lantern. But when he first became a Green Lantern, he was headstrong, he was arrogant. This came to bear with a planet called Xanchi. This, this was basically a planet that was part of this really weird storyline, but the idea is that there was a bomb in the middle of the planet, and instead of basically keeping it safe, instead of keeping the bomb from detonating, Jon Stewart flew in and tried to basically uh, defuse it. The result was that the bomb went off, killed the planet, and killed everybody on it. This is weighed on Jon Stewart 
Stewart's mind ever since. And that's the cool thing about this, it's always been a background of his character. And so him being here, he's the only one on this Black Lantern version of Xanchi, this planet that was reconstituted by the Black Lantern rings alongside everybody who was killed. But the cool thing about this is John Stewart is not a guy to be trifled with. <laughs> John Stewart is an absolute beast. He literally just starts creating machine gun constructs and he unleashes holy hell on every single one of these Black Lanterns. It is pretty amazing. But ultimately, John Stewart also recognizes that if he were to continue fighting this battle on his own, he would assuredly die. And if he's taken down by one of the Black Lanterns, it'll just add to their existing ranks. Now, jumping back to Earth, because I know you guys are really interested in Earth, the Black Lantern Justice League versus all these different superheroes, or at least whatever's left, is actually pretty impressive because they're all basically fighting their own personal demons. It's no accident that each of these members is being, you know, being pitted against somebody who they are most familiar with. For example, when Hal Jordan became Parallax during the old Emerald Twilight stories, him facing off against Superman and defeating him has always been considered an insult to Superman himself and the rest of the superhero community. Now, a lot of this was because of the fact that Hal Jordan's Parallax was trying to obliterate the entirety of the universe, but it was still pretty cool. But Barry Allen grabbing Hal Jordan and racing a couple seconds into the future basically allows, or at least it means, these Black Lantern rings that are chasing them are basically gone because while they are a couple seconds ahead, at the end of the day, in the present moment, right then and there, they're gone. While all this is happening, Jon Stewart is racing to Earth with an army of all these Black Lanterns behind him. So all these things are basically crescendoing down into this moment when uh, everybody basically coalesces on Earth. Everybody shows up on Earth and it's this massive final battle. The other half of this is that while these leaders of the various Lantern Corps are able to face off against some of these threats, at the end of the day, the number of Black Lanterns there are, are almost overwhelming. There's millions of them. And so in response to this, Ganthid, one of the Guardians of the Universe, one of the guys who helped to create the Green Lantern Corps, comes along and basically says, I'm making myself a Green Lantern. Not only that, because of the fact that almost all the rings are basically built on the very nature of the Lantern Rings themselves, the Green Lantern Rings, in the sense of how they're designed, how they're programmed, what this means is that each member, each, each one of these guys can basically create a deputy of sorts. The ring can duplicate itself and then go out and find a host. What this does is it allows for a temporary bolstering of numbers. We end up seeing these rings race off and pick some amazing hosts. The first one that gets picked is Lex Luthor. And it's the coolest thing ever because while all this is going on, Lex Luthor is met with an orange ring of avarice. He becomes an orange lantern. Scarecrow becomes a yellow lantern. Barry Allen, a blue lantern, so on and so forth. It's one of the coolest things ever. We get to see characters as, mem as various members of the Lantern Corps that we would normally never see in this particular scenario. And that's why it's so interesting is because Blackest Night was designed to be this massive story that was huge in scope. But one of the first things that people started asking when we saw these introductions of these different Lantern Corps is, well, what would happen if Superman became like a Red Lantern? Or what would happen if like Wonder Woman became like a Star Sapphire? That's, that's the way this plays out is because it's basically giving fans their heart's desires. Here's what you want to see. Characters who would never have a Lantern Ring suddenly get one and then what would they be like? Now, of course, in the middle of all this, we transition basically out to what's left of the Green Lantern Corps, to Kyle Rayner, to Saranic Natu, the daughter of Sinestro, all these different things. Now, remember, in the last video, we talked about how Kyle Rayner had basically died, how Kyle Rayner as a Green Lantern was believed to have been dead. It took the combined efforts of one of the Star Sapphires, the Lantern Tribe of Love, to grab Saranic Natu, the daughter of Sinestro, who Kyle Rayner, I guess, who was in love with Kyle Rayner, to basically tether that life force and bring back Kyle Rayner, to effectively sort of resurrect him. The problem with this is that in that moment when Kyle Rayner was dead, Guy Gardner of Earth lost it. Now, here's a funny thing. Man, I love Guy Gardner. Guy Gardner fans are, are relatively small. I mean, it's not the biggest fan base out there, but by God, they are hardcore. They, lo <laughs> they love Guy Gardner. <laughs> And understandably so, because Guy Gardner is like the guy you want in your corner. When the world's going to pot, when it's all going down, if I'm somebody and I'm like, okay, who am I going to pick to be my Green Lantern and who do I want in my corner? Guy Gardner, because he will fight until he dies. Like he's just, <laughs> he is so awesome and he's so badass. But the guy's a former cop, you know, basically become a Green Lantern. So like, he's a no nonsense guy. In this scenario, when he lost his mind, he was suddenly bonded with a Red Lantern ring. Now remember, when it comes to the Red Lanterns, you don't get to choose to become one. When you get so full of rage and so 
so full of wrath, the Red Lantern Ring just shows up to you and says, you have great rage in your heart, you belong to the Red Lantern Corps, and just forces itself onto you. But this is important, because when a person becomes a Red Lantern, their heart basically gets replaced by the Red Lantern Ring, which means to say, the Red Lantern Ring becomes their heart, their blood gets replaced with plasma. If Kyle Rayner or somebody were to walk up and just take the Red Lantern Ring off of Guy Gardner, it would kill him. His heart would basically cease to exist, his body would shut down, and that would be the end of him. And so this is basically a conflict on two fronts. Is Kyle Rayner and Saronic Natu and the Green Lantern Corps trying to face off against the Black Lanterns, while at the same time trying to find a way to bring Guy Gardner back? Now, none of it really matters anyway, because Guy Gardner as a Red Lantern is wrecking the Black Lanterns. <laughs> It is, it's, dude, it is one of the coolest things to see because, dude, the guy, the guy loses his, man, look at this upcoming action right here. The guy loses his mind on these black, on these black lanterns. Like, they're, they're doing what they can, but it doesn't matter, man. Guy, dude, Guy Gardner freaks out and says, come, come, come fail me. <laughs> it's one of the coolest things ever to see his character freak out like this because he's just a force of nature like he's just wrecking through every last one of these black lanterns not enough that he's destroying them in their entirety and reducing the number by a huge portion but certainly enough that the black lanterns are starting to get a little concerned now in the middle of all this we're met with the arrival of mogo basically this planet that received a green lantern ring now mogo is one of the most powerful green lanterns out there just because of the fact that he's able to put out a massive amount of power because of his size but mogo is also like this secondary base of operations because he's a planet, should Oa, the home base of the Green Lanterns and the Guardians of the Universe, should it ever be destroyed, Mogo would become their base of operations. We saw that in the New 52. But what Mogo also says is that in this moment right now, there is a protocol that was devised by the Guardians of the Universe that was given to Mogo. Should Oa ever become overrun, the idea of Mogo is to implement what's called a purge, to effectively purge those who are intruding. In this instance, it's the Black Lanterns. And so what Mogo does is basically increase his own gravitational pull and then grab all, every every single thing within his immediate vicinity on uh, on Oa and drag it directly to where he's at and it brings them all down to the surface of his own planet what he does is he basically grabs these black lanterns and starts pulling them down into his own core which is superheated like the core of any planet and then basically just starts atomizing them so sure I guess their rings are there but their physical bodies are destroyed and the rings are useless without a physical body and so where the day is won so to speak for a temporary moment what we end up still having is Guy Gardner as a red lantern and so the question becomes, how do you fix him? How do you fix a guy who's a Red Lantern? The only way to really fix a Red Lantern, quote unquote, is to basically have a Blue Lantern show up and cleanse their body of the red impurity and then allow the, the removal of a ring. If a Blue Lantern's not there, there doesn't seem to be a legit conceivable way in order to save Guy Gardner. But there is. Okay, so we are, uh, we're wrapping up Blackest Night. We have like this one and then there's another video today and then we're done. And uh, we're going to be finished with our double uploads on, on Blackest Night. As much as I love it, I kind of want to return to just doing like Green Lantern videos once a week because I think it gets a little weird oversaturating with Green Lanterns. Too many Green Lantern videos drives everybody crazy. But anyway, uh, so for those of you guys who are new, the long and short of this is that Blackest Night is basically the end times. It's this idea that these Black Lantern rings have just kind of risen out of nowhere. And the result is that they're bonding themselves to people who are both living and dead. Now with those who are living, it's basically those who have died and then they were supposed to move on to the afterlife, but they didn't. DC editorial decided to bring them back, but within the confines of DC's story itself, which is to say within the DC universe, it was this idea that the, the entity of death, Necron, had stepped in and kept those characters from dying. And so at this moment right now, there are two conflicts taking place. The first one is out in space involving the Green Lantern Corps, and the second is on Earth. And on Earth, it's largely just the superheroes that are there doing the best they can to stave off against this conflict. It's members of the Sinestro Corps, Green Lantern Corps, and so on and so forth. It's all the cores on Earth trying to stop the end of all things. Because remember, if the Black Lanterns basically bond rings to everybody, then the emotional spectrum will effectively cease to exist. All beings everywhere will feel no emotion whatsoever. And the result is that they will just sort of usher in this new era of darkness. The universe itself will effectively die. Now, what we covered up to this point was the idea that the superheroes were just trying to stave off this eventuality. They were trying to stave off the idea that everything was going to die. But in the middle of their attempts to stop the being Necron, they're suddenly met by the arrival of the Spectre. Now, the Spectre is a character that we haven't really talked about too often. We haven't really done a whole lot with him. When it came to the Spectre as a concept, he goes all the way back to like 1940. I mean, he's one of DC's oldest characters. He was created by Jerry Siegel, I think it was. And the whole idea was that the Spectre was designed to be really one of the earliest components of DC's whole mythological side, which is to say all their demons and angels and, and so on and so forth. But the Spectre is the living embodiment of 
of basically God's vengeance in the sense that there was a guy named Jim Corgan. He was shot in the line of duty. Instead of dying, he basically became a host for the Spectre. And so the Spectre basically just travels around Earth in the DC landscape and finds those individuals who have been judged by God as basically being condemned to damnation and then just whisks them away. And that's really about it. But the whole idea with the Spectre is that in the early days, he was crazy powerful. I mean, he was almost reality warping, godly powerful. Now, when Crisis on Infinite Earths going forward, if, you know, after the mid 1980s, DC depowered him quite a bit. But the whole idea was that the Jim Corgan and Spectre dichotomy reigned supreme for quite some time, but different writers did different things with the characters. But the whole idea was that in the post-crisis landscape, DC actually killed off the character of Jim Corgan. The whole idea here is that following the death of Jim Corgan, there was a story called Day of Judgment, and even then there were some, you know, stories that took place in between there, where it was basically the question of what is DC going to do with the character of the Spectre? What are they going to do with the character of Hal Jordan? Remember, in 1993, Hal Jordan basically became Parallax, and we'll talk more about that here in a minute. But the idea was that, you know, Hal Jordan basically became this corruptible guy, uh, and DC was removing him to replace him with Kyle Rayner. And so it made sense to basically merge, you know, Hal Jordan and the Spectre together, which is where all that stuff happened. But the whole idea was that there was a sort of bouncing around that took place with the Spectre concept. Now, in terms of how it exists now, uh, Hal Jordan and the Spectre split from one another. It presented itself as the same scenario. What do they do with the Spectre if he doesn't have a host? And so what this did is it introduced a character by the name of Crispin Allen. And the whole idea was that Crispin Allen was basically this guy who was a partner of the character of Renee Montoya. Crispin Allen is basically the new host for the Spectre. And it's one of those interesting scenarios because what this does is it actually leads us into the concept of Parallax. Because the Spectre is designed to be the living embodiment of God's vengeance, and because the Spectre, while he is weaker than he's historically been, is still an incredibly powerful being, what this means is that none of the heroes on Earth can actually stop the Spectre. Now, in terms of the fact that Crispin Allen was killed and then became a host, for the for the Spectre, this meant that Crispin Allen could actually become a Black Lantern. And that's what we saw over the course of the Blackest Night story, is we basically saw a ring bond itself to Crispin Allen. And so what we learned over the course of Blackest Night is that instead of the Black Lantern rings actually resurrecting the dead, instead what they were doing is they were bonding themselves to the corpses of those who died and then basically duplicating them. And so in this instance, this Black Lantern Spectre is not actually the Spectre. Instead, it's the ring creating an image of the Spectre. And the way that we know that is because because of the fact that with Hal Jordan basically sitting down and saying, we cannot defeat the Spectre on our own because of the sheer power that he has, he says, the only way to do this is to bring back an entity that I've never wanted to bring back again. What he does is he brings back Parallax. But at this moment right now, when Hal Jordan basically goes back to being Parallax, when he returns to being a host for the Parallax entity, he's not as powerful as he was. But the goal of him returning to the role of Parallax is not for the purpose of destroying the Spectre, it's for the purpose of bringing the Spectre out. When Hal Jordan as Parallax begins fighting the Spectre and essentially tears him open, what we end up finding is that within this Black Lantern shell is the actual Spectre himself alongside Crispus Allen. And so they're basically being held captive and their power is being channeled and used by the Black Lantern ring. Now, following this defeat of Black Lantern Spectre, what ends up happening is it's basically just Hal Jordan being split in half again. Because Hal Jordan is still in there, he has an emotional tie to Carol Ferris. Carol Ferris was the love interest of Hal Jordan for years and years and years and years. And so because of this, it's basically this idea that the Spectre can seize hold of Parallax and pull the entity out of Hal Jordan, but only if somebody is pulling the other direction. And that's why that works is because it's basically Carol Ferris, who grabs onto the Hal Jordan concept and pulls on him while the Parallax entity is being pulled out, and it means that Hal Jordan goes back to his normal self. The other half of this is actually the actions of Atrocitus of the Red Lantern, but one of the things that Jeff John hits on here is the idea of the Red Lantern entity, and so what this is going to do is lead into all these different entities. Now, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, but for right now, what this also hits at is the idea that no one can really escape the might of a Lantern ring, so long as a being is sentient. If a ring can bond to them, they can become part of that core. And in this instance, what Atrocitus actually tries to do is bond uh, the Spectre to the Red Lantern ring, but it doesn't last. It lasts maybe for like a panel or two. And the reason for this is because when a Red Lantern ring takes over a host, a certain amount of time has to pass before that person is completely converted into a Red Lantern. But in this instance, because the Spectre is so powerful, he doesn't fall prey. His heart's not replaced or anything along those lines. But the reason why Atrocitus did this is because 
because Atrocitus has actually believed that the Spectre is basically the Red Lantern entity that Atrocitus has been looking for, the Red Lantern equivalent to like Parallax. And so because of this, the Spectre simply responds by saying, you can't make me into a Red Lantern, but I've met the entity that you're looking for. And if you find it, it will kill you. It's this idea that Jeff Johns is setting the stage for this huge, expansive revelation of all these different things that will come later on down the line with regards to all these different cores. Now, with regards to the Spectre himself, what he ends up doing is actually try to take out Necron. But this is a major limitation of the Spectre. While the Spectre used to be this godly, powerful being back in the 40s and the 50s and 60s and 70s, nowadays, he's basically just a guy that shows up and just whisks the souls of the damned off, and that's it. That's really all there is to it. In this instance, Necron does not have a soul. And so in this instance, because of the fact that Necron does not actually have a soul for the Spectre to take, the Spectre is basically powerless against him. Not only this, Necron actually whisks the Spectre away. What it means is the right hand of God cannot stop Necron. Now, if the Presence chose to step in, sure, like that would be the end of it, and Necron would be defeated. But, you know, in this circumstance, the story needs to be told. <laughs> so aside from pulling in, you know, one of those caveats, that's really about it. Things wrap up pretty fast. Now, with regards to the whole idea of Guy Gardner and the Green Lantern Corps, one of the things that we had talked about in the last video was that the Green Lantern Corps itself, at least what was left of the number due to the fact that so many of them were being killed by Black Lanterns and then being converted into Black Lanterns themselves, Kyle Rayner, one of the more popular Green Lanterns, was believed to have been killed. And in his rage, Guy Gardner had lost his mind and then was bonded with a Red Lantern ring. And what we're seeing right now is this transitionary period where Guy Gardner is basically at a point where if the ring is pulled off, he will essentially die. The various Green Lanterns are basically trying to find a way to bring Guy Gardner down and then basically cure him. Because remember, when a person becomes a Red Lantern, they're just mindless rage. And so the Green Lantern planet Mogo is actually able to offer some measure of a reprieve. And it's really cool the way this happens. What Mogo basically does is force uh, Guy Gardner to basically have this inner fight with himself, which is to say the Green Lantern part of himself that recalls all the great memories and the love interests he's had and different things like that. And the Red Lantern part of himself that really just kind of feeds on all the horrible experiences that he's had. The idea here is to actually offer some measure of a distraction to allow the Green Lanterns to muster their number and then subdue uh, Guy Gardner. And so what this does is it allows Mogo the planet to actually pull Guy Gardner down inside of him and then begin releasing all these different leeches. Now, this is the second way in which a person can be cured when it comes to Red Lantern rage. In truth, while this does purge a lot of the Red Lantern energy out of them, one of the things that's a immediately made clear is that Guy Gardner is not completely cured of the Red Lantern energy. If his ring was removed, he would die. And so the only way to really bring him back, the only way to restore some measure of normalcy is to bring him to a Blue Lantern because Blue Lanterns are the ones that basically go through this sort of cleansing process and they're the only way in which a person who is a Red Lantern can safely have their ring removed and then go back to being part of whatever core they were before. So again, this basically brings the Green Lantern core directly to Earth where this final battle will take place. And so again, transitioning back to Earth proper, while all these different heroes are basically trying to defeat Necron, at the end of the day, they're not able to defeat a being of such intense power. The arrival of Guy Gardner and the other Green Lanterns, the fact that the Blue Lanterns are here, all the different cores have united under the idea of trying to defeat Necron, but none of them can do it because he's just such an astronomically powerful being. Not only that, we end up getting an explanation as to why it was that Necron stepped in the way and kept all these different superheroes from dying over the course of their lives. The reason for this is because Necron has been seeking something out, and the only way he can attain it is to actually kill one of the guardians of the universe and then use their blood in a ritual of sorts, and then in turn, wake up something called the life entity. And so when it comes to the, to the life entity itself, it's essentially this idea that this is kind of a representation of where life originated. And that's one of the big revelations that comes out of this, is because it was believed that the guardians of the universe, the Mount were the first race in the universe. But what this reveals to us is life did not start with the Malthusians, it started on Earth. The Malthusians covered that up. They basically took the life entity, buried it in the core of the Earth, and then wrote it out of history in order to, one, ensure that people would believe that they were the original source of life in the universe, the first race to pop up, and two, to maintain their power and to protect the life entity to keep an event like this from actually happening. It is designed to show the Guardians of the Universe as beings who are full of human hubris, who believed that they legitimately have the right to decide how the universe should progress. And so it basically would have brought the entire foundation of what it is that made the Guardians
guardians of the universe as they are crashing down around them and people would have just lost trust in them entirely not to mention the green lantern corps probably would have vacated but more so than that the life entity is the representation of life in the dc universe and if somebody harnesses that power they would become god and that's the fear that the, that the guardians of the universe have that if people knew the life entity exists it would be like this great gold rush for the power of the life entity it could potentially even usher in this massive universal civil war of people who were coveting all this power and whoever came out on top no matter what their intentions were they would be virtually unstoppable and so in this instance where Hal Jordan rationalizes and says okay well we have to seize the seize the power of the life entity in order to basically destroy Necron and the Black Lantern Corps Thal Sinestro steps in and Thal Sinestro says no you had parallax I get the life entity and so what we end up having here is basically the rise of the first White Lantern in the form of Thal Sinestro who seizes the power of the life entity itself. Okay, so picking up with the conclusion of Blackest Night, we're finally here, we're finally done. <laughs> <laughs> Something like 10 videos later, we're finally finished with Blackest Night. Uh, God, this story's lengthy. Brightest Day is even longer, but the cool thing is that Brightest Day does not have nearly as many interesting tie-ins. So uh, that'll actually be done in probably around like anywhere between four to six videos. It won't take anywhere near as long. So uh, when it comes to Blackest Night, again, we're basically dealing with the end of everything. We're dealing with the conclusion of the event, which is to say this final battle between the Black Lanterns, as well as all the other Lantern Corps and the superheroes who were trying to stop them. Now, something I want to point out here because over the course of the Blackest Night series, I've been looking through the comments that you guys have been leaving with like a lot of questions and different things like that. And one of the most common questions that I've seen is if Necron is like the living embodiment of death in the Green Lantern universe when it comes to the emotional spectrum, then how does DC consolidate that and how do they make that work with like death of the endless and different things along those lines? So here's the deal, a little bit of a little bit of explanation here. When it comes to comic books, you will oftentimes have entities that will represent the same thing, multiple entities entities will represent the same thing. Sometimes comic book publishers make an effort to consolidate that and make it make sense, and sometimes they don't. When it comes to the Green Lantern line of stories in DC Comics, when it first launched, it was very much in line with a lot of the DC stuff, but the more popular it became, the more DC began to adopt the mindset, if it works, don't fix it. And so what they ended up doing was basically telling Jeff Johns, do what you want to do. As long as it fits in with the continuity of stories, we don't really care what goes on. And so what ended up happening is he was creating all these different entities and things like that. Next Necron is the living embodiment of death. How that reconciles with like death of the endless, I don't know. Now the, the continuity sticklers, this will drive them nuts. <laughs> they will go crazy over this, but you just kind of have to roll with it. You, you have to go with it. It's the nature of comics. It does make things a little bit confusing and it does make things a little strange, but continuing on with this whole scenario, because of the fact that all the roads of these different characters are leading to Earth, which is to say Guy Gardner and Kyle Rayner and the Green Lantern Corps, you know, basically traveling to Earth because that's where the brunt of the conflict of Black Blackest Night is taking place with Jon Stewart of the Green Lanterns traveling to Earth because that's where a brunt of the conflict is taking place. All these stories begin to consolidate into one giant amalgamation of everything going on in a singular location. But keep in mind, when it comes to the, the stories that we've seen so far, one of the things that we found was that there was a Black Lantern planet called Xanchi, a planet that had previously been destroyed by the actions of Jon Stewart of the Green Lanterns. The result is that the planet itself was made into a Black Lantern and then housed all these people that had died on it when it exploded and they became Black Lanterns as well. And so with Jon Stewart showing up, basically making amends with his past mistakes and then leading Xanchi directly to Earth, this meant that this whole planet and all these Black Lanterns on it come flying back towards Earth. Now, at the same time, keep in mind, the idea of the Black Lanterns attacking members of the different cores is still there and they all do it in their own individual way. But keep in mind, you know, whenever we talked about ideas where comic book publishers were like Marvel or DC was testing the waters and they were bringing characters back and they were basically doing soft reboots, that's what this is. You're literally learning about this in real time. The whole event of Blackest Night is just pick and choose what characters get to come back and what characters don't. But it also hits at the very nature of the characters themselves. With Kyle Rayner, there was a woman in his life by the name of Alex DeWitt. And Alex DeWitt was really one of the huge, really one of the biggest controversial characters out there because of the way in which she died. When it comes to DC, there's a character called Major Force. And Major Force was a guy who was created by Carrie Bates and Greg Weissman, I think it was 
was. And so the whole idea was that Major Force was basically a guy who was working for something called the Quorum Organization, I think. And this really coincided with the establishment of Kyle Rayner being the Green Lantern. The idea of the Quorum Organization, which was just this really clandestine, corrupt aspect of the US government, was to basically get the power of the Green Lantern. But they could not directly challenge Kyle Rayner because of how powerful he was. And so the idea was to demoralize him and have one of two things happen. Either he gives up or they're able to basically just take him out in a moment of weakness. And so what had happened is that under the direction of the Quorum organization, Major Force killed Alex DeWitt, the girlfriend of Kyle Rayner, basically broke every single bone in her body and then crumpled her in a refrigerator. And it was a massive controversy when that happened because it created this archetype that like love interests always just quote unquote end up in refrigerators, women in refrigerators. Kind of a fun fact, uh, the writer, or one of the writers at the time, Gail Simone, actually launched a website called womeninrefrigerators.com, I think. And that's where that phrase came from. But the whole idea was that it established this precedent that Kyle Rayner can never find love. Every woman he falls in love with will eventually die. But the idea is that with Kyle Rayner facing off against the Black Lanterns, Alex DeWitt comes back as one. Now remember, the Black Lanterns serve the purpose of basically manipulating people, of forcing them to feel a wide array of different emotions. And then when their hearts are completely charged, you know, consuming that emotion, basically killing them and then turning them into Black Lanterns in turn. And so in this instance, what Alex DeWitt does is actually taunt Kyle Rayner over and over again by giving him a description of everything that Major Force had done when he killed her. Because remember, all Kyle Rayner knew is he came home and he just found her stuffed in a refrigerator and that was it. What this does is it goes through line by line and it says Major Force broke every single bone in her body, broke her spine, broke her neck, the whole nine yards, and then stuffed her in a fridge. But by forcing Kyle Rayner to relive this massively traumatic moment in his life, the goal of the Black Lanterns is to turn him, is to basically put him in a moment of weakness, kill him, take his heart, and then turn him into a Black Lantern. The funny thing about this is, remember, he already experienced this at the hands of Jade, another love interest who had basically died. Kyle Rayner had experienced this emotional manipulation. And so it's one of those things where it's like, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And so he's not as easily manipulated because he sees right through the guys. He's not emotionally taunted. Now, this is important because one of the things that I hope you guys notice over the course of the Blackest Night event, and even over the course of everything we've done in Jeff John's run, is it's building up the character of Kyle Rayner emotionally, psychologically. It's building him up to a guy where he can basically withstand virtually anything. And that will become exceedingly important later on down the line. But again, because of the fact that this is everybody really trying to deal with the Black Lanterns and trying to figure out a way to end the Black Lanterns coming across their central power battery, the source of all their energy, what we discover is the fate of the Anti-Monitor. Now remember, during the end of Sinestro Core War, when the Anti-Monitor was basically revealed to have been resurrected when the multiverse came back after Infinite Crisis, when we ended up having this whole idea that the Anti-Monitor joined Sinestro, he was more or less kind of the, the harbinger of the core, and then ultimately was defeated by the Guardians of the Universe and so on and so forth, the Green Lanterns, is that the Anti-Monitor was just sort of whisked away and then suddenly there was a Black Lantern central power battery. Of course, what, what this ends up telling us here is the Anti-Monitor is basically the source of energy for the central power battery. Now, of course, with the other lanterns who were here, uh, they all do their best to try to take him out. The problem is that the Anti-Monitor is not fully a Black Lantern. And the reason why that matters is because, remember, when a person is full on a Black Lantern, a massive shock of just white light can take them out. But because the Anti-Monitor is not fully a Black Lantern yet, that's not enough. You need an insane source of energy, a massive amount of energy to be able to destroy him, along with a huge amount of bright light. And so what they end up doing is they grab the character of Dove. Now, Dove is an interesting concept in DC Comics. Honestly, I don't know that much about her. I know enough to be able to say that she's one of these characters that is uh, that's, that really exists alongside the, the concept of Hawk and Dove. Originally, it was uh, it was Don Hall and it was Hank Hall, I think it was. I wanna say Hank Hall was Hawk and Don Hall was, was Dove, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But it's basically this idea that they represent law and order. They represent, you know, war and chaos. I think Hawk represents war and chaos. Dove represents law and order. They're basically two opposing dichotomies that function in unison and essentially are superheroes in a lot of ways. In this story right now, Dawn, the energy that she puts off in terms of this white light, as far as I'm aware, is something that has not been explained. Not at the time that this story is given. I don't know if we ever get an explanation. I'm not 100% sure about that. If we do, Brightest Day would probably be the place where it happens. But the whole idea is that because she lets off this massive amount of light energy, basically, this, this white energy, they put her in like a pod and they shoot her into the brain of the Anti-Monitor. They literally shoot him into his head. Now, it's not enough to destroy him in his entirety. Remember, the Anti-Monitor is just this godly being and he can usually always reconstitute himself. But it does offer a chance for them to grab the Anti-Monitor, try to pull him out, but it doesn't work. He ends up getting yanked back into the Black 
Lantern's central power battery, and he continues to be a power source once more. And so again, this is really Jeff John sitting down and saying, all right, here are the ways in which to defeat Necron of the Black Lantern Corps. The Anti-Monitor is not one of them. And so again, this basically brings, you know, Guy Gardner and all those guys directly back to Earth in an attempt to try to take out, you know, Necron and, and all the Black Lanterns and all that kind of good stuff. Now, again, in the last video, we had talked about how we saw the emergence of the white light entity, the entity of life, which is to say somewhere along the line when the multiverse came into existence, when everything was created, the life entity came along with it. Now, this is actually kind of cool because a lot of people looked at this and they said, well, this contradicts everything we know about the origin of the universe. Actually, it doesn't. The origin of the multiverse stays the same. It's still the idea that there was just this hand that came out of the beginning of all things and that hand spawned the creation of the multiverse and so on and so forth. All this means is that when the multiverse was new, before anything came into existence, when it was basically created, but was just a vacant, empty space, the life entity was born. And the life entity, while we don't know who made it, we don't know where it came from, the life entity was responsible for the creation of all life that exists on Earth and presumably out in the universe. And so with Thal Sinestro as the host of the life entity at the moment, following its introduction to the fact that he seized hold of it, what it does is it gives us this sort of play-by-play -play of how everything on Earth unfolded, this sense that when the life entity emerged on Earth, that it gave birth to the first single-celled organisms, and then those single-celled organisms evolved into multi-cell organisms. One of those organisms wanted to live. It wanted to grow. It wanted to continue on, and it gave itself the willpower to do that, and in doing so, became the first entity of the emotional spectrum, the ion whale, the representation of willpower in the Green Lantern mythos in the emotional spectrum. Following this, there were organisms that took off from the sea in order to live on land, fearful of their own extinction. That fear gave way to the existence of parallax. We saw things like love, which gave birth to the predator, the creation of the bull based on rage, the idea that something killed something else out of anger, out of malice for the first time. All these different entities are born from emotion. They're born from the idea that some organism, human or otherwise, felt that emotion for the very first time. And when that emotion was felt for the very first time, then it in turn gave birth to that entity in the emotional spectrum. And so what this means is that it's basically saying all life in the universe originated on Earth. It all started with Earth. And that's where the emotional spectrum came from. And so with this in mind, because of the fact that the white life is basically the antithesis to the Black Lantern Corps, meaning it's the only thing that can actually legitimately destroy uh, the Black Lanterns in their entirety, Necron panics and impales Thal Sinestro. Now again, that's an important thing to keep in mind. When it comes to a being who is in possession of one of the entities, it doesn't mean their physical body cannot be harmed. They can still be harmed. They can still be taken out. The caveat is the White Lanterns. Because the White Lantern is the representation of of life, a person who is a White Lantern can never truly die so long as they're in possession of the White Lantern entity. We know this with the case of Thal Sinestro, because while he is basically split in half, none of the other Lanterns who are analyzing him see any anything to indicate there's been any actual damage to his body. As far as their rings are concerned, looking at Thal Sinestro, he's just as normal as he ever was. And that's because what the life entity does is basically heal his physical form and return him back to normal. That's what we're talking about with this level of power, Thal Sinestro, as the host for the White Lantern, is basically God. It's insane how much power he has. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that just because a being becomes a host for the entity, for, for any one of the Lantern entities, doesn't mean they suddenly know everything about everything. There's a learning curve. You have to learn what the life entity is capable of. You have to learn the limits of its power. And that's why in this moment, Thal Sinestro doesn't just snap his fingers and everything goes back to normal and everything's fixed. He doesn't know the full length of what it is he's capable of. All Thal Sinestro knows is the history of the White Lanterns, is the history of the fact that the White Lanterns represent life. The problem is that Thal Sinestro is hubris. He's full of arrogance. Thal Sinestro being host for the White Lantern, he's not doing that because he believes it's the right thing to do. He's doing that because he sees himself as the best of all the Lanterns. And that's always been the downfall of Sinestro. In every single circumstance, whenever Sinestro gained some extreme level of power, his arrogance was always his downfall. Now, his first attempt to take out Necron is actually pretty successful in the sense that he rips his heart out and totally destroys it. But keep in mind, in the Green Lantern mythos, Necron is a living embodiment of death, and he's surrounded by Black Lanterns. And so all that ends up happening is he basically just transfers his essence to another Black Lantern, and he's reborn again. He's, in effect, an immutable, indestructible force, but only under the circumstance that his tether is allowed to remain on Earth. Now, the heroes did not know about this, and we're not discovering this until right now. William Hand is basically the tether of 
Necron. Remember, William Hand was a guy who was basically just obsessed with death, that death was the only thing that mattered, that everything dies. And so because he was so obsessed with it, Necron effectively latched his essence and established William Hand as a tether. And what this means is that so long as William Hand is dead and is a Black Lantern, Necron will always come back. And so the idea is to basically eliminate William Hand, but killing him won't do any good because he's already dead. He's already a Black Lantern. And so the only thing they can do to remove him from being a tether of Necron is to actually bring him back to life, is to essentially resurrect him. Now notice this, it's a really cool scenario to unfold here because it's basically all the heroes coming to grips with everything. I mean, for the most part, when you're Barry Allen and you, you know, quote unquote, died during Crisis on Infinite Earths and then you came back, you're just kind of like, okay, cool, that's awesome. And when you're Hal Jordan and you were Parallax and you were basically destroyed and then you came back, you're just like, oh, well, you know, that's, that's cool, whatever. And what's been espoused by Necron so far is that each and every time one of these characters died, he's the one that stepped in the way and he's the one that brought them back. But what we're end up, what we end up learning here is this is propaganda. This is nonsense by Necron. It's him just running off at the mouth and espousing things in order to make everyone believe that he's this, you know, immutable, indestructible force. And he's the absolute authority on what lives and what dies. In truth, that's not the case. The point that Hal Jordan makes here, and one of the things that he comes to the realization of is sure, when they all were supposed to have died, Necron basically stood in the way between them and the afterlife. But it doesn't mean they had to come back. It doesn't mean they had to return from the dead. What it meant is they chose to come back. They chose to go back to being who they were before. Now, the intricacies behind this are wide and varying based on the character at the time. You look at these characters and you see them going and greeting death in a wide array of different ways, sometimes willingly and sometimes unwillingly. But the goal that Hal Jordan makes is when they were presented with the opportunity to come back to return to life, they chose that. And so all Necron did was stand in their way and steer them a different direction. They chose what direction they went in. And so our desire to live is stronger than our desire to die, i.e. we have a stronger connection to life than we do to death. And the reason why that matters is because that creates a click. And what ends up happening is every single member of the Justice League, every single character who has died and has come back becomes a White Lantern. Now it's a fleeting thing. It's only for a momentary thing. They actually channel it all directly into William Hand and effectively resurrect him, basically get his heart pumping again and bring him back to life. In doing so, it destroys the tether that Necron has on Earth and essentially sends him flying back. But not only that, remember, we talked about how Blackest Night was a soft reboot, that DC would use the events of Blackest Night to basically begin going through and deciding who would live and who would die. This is that moment when a white lantern ring flies through Necron and effectively destroys his heart and sends him back to the realm of the unliving. What this does is it basically starts seeing the resurrection of all these different things. The Anti-Monitor is resurrected, Firestorm and Martian Manhunter and Jade and like Hawk and Eobard Thawne, you know, it's Maxwell Lord, all these characters, DC just starts bringing back. And that's the point of Blackest Night. The point of Blackest Night is for DC to sit down and say, we have an event where everybody's gonna die. We're gonna do a clean slate. Everybody's gonna be killed. Then we're gonna introduce the White Lanterns. Then we're gonna use the power of the White Lanterns to decide who basically gets resurrected and who goes back to being dead when the power of the Black Lantern rings are destroyed. It's basically a lot of the most popular characters. It's DC in a lot of ways consolidating their entire publication lineup and reducing the number of heroes that they currently have out there. And that's why you end up seeing a lot of these characters who had previously died walking around after the events of Blackest Night going into Brightest Day is because they were all effectively resurrected. And so once everything comes to an end, you know, once it's all said and done, the question becomes, well, then what happened to the white light? It's apparently it's gone now. You know, nobody's in possession of it anymore. And so what Jeff Johns does is he teases the events of Brightest Day by basically saying there's a white lantern power battery out there now. There's basically going to be a white lantern core. But how that number progresses, what happens to them is anybody's guess. And we'll have to wait till Black to, to Brightest Day to find out. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like. And yeah, we are finished with Blackest Night. We are done. The Blackest Night double uploads are done. Because <laughs> I was getting kind of burned out on Blackest Night, to be honest with you guys. But, uh, but yeah, we are finished. So anyway, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end, and I will catch you all later. Peace.